Hello everybody and welcome to Programming Expert. In this video, I'll be giving you an introduction to object-oriented programming. Now, object-oriented programming is really a style of programming. And what that means is that this is not specific to Python. Other programming languages implement a form of object-oriented programming and well, Python does as well. And so a lot of the concepts I'm going to teach you here in this section are going to apply to other programming languages as well. They are not purely Python specific. And in fact, the way we design this section is to make it such that a lot of the stuff you're going to learn here, you can easily apply to other languages, say like Java, C++, or any other language really that implements some form of object oriented programming. So what will change as you go to another language is the syntax and the grammar will look a little bit different that you need to write to actually implement these features. But the overall concepts will be the same and that will allow you to quickly kind of pick up OOP in a language like Java or C++ or whatever it may be. Anyways, just want to give you a quick intro there and make sure you understand this is not specific to Python. Yes, we will do the demos and the explanations using Python code, and there will be some small details in Python that won't apply to other languages. But generally, most of this will carry over and will be useful in all kinds of other languages. With that said, let's go ahead and dive into this video and start explaining what is actually meant by object oriented programming. So the funny thing is, this seems like a very new concept to most of us. We hear this term object oriented programming seems like a very complicated and new topic, but we've actually already been working with objects and with object oriented programming throughout the entire last section. We just didn't realize it. Now, when we say object oriented programming, really what we're talking about is the interactions of objects within a program. That's why it's called object oriented programming, because everything is oriented around objects. So let me show you an example of an object. If I do something like x equals one, what I've actually just done is I've said the variable x is storing the object, which is an integer that has value one. So this is an object one. Yes, it is an int, but an int is actually an object. And if I do something like y equals string, well, this is an object as well. The type of the object is type string, but this is an object. If I do something like this, this again is an object. Now we're looking at a mutable object. We can change and modify this object. And this object is of type list. OK, so the main thing I'm trying to get you to realize here is that everything we've been using, all of our data types, whenever we create them like this, we are creating a new object, which is known as an instance of a specific type. So this type is an int, this type is a string, and this type is a list. And all of these are instances of what's known as those classes. Now we're going to slowly build our way up here and you'll learn a lot of the vocabulary as we go through. So don't worry about it too much right now, but I'm just trying to give you a general introduction. Anyways, let's look at what I mean by type. So I'm saying that these objects are of type something. So let's just look at what happens when I print the type of X. Now I know we've seen this before, but let's run it and notice we get class int. Now, previously, I told you just to ignore the class and just look at int. But now I want to actually look at the class. So the class is actually something that's built into Python. And this class defines the behavior of all int data types. So all objects, which are instances of the class int, the class or the type of an object is really kind of a blueprint describing how this object can behave in the program. And so we saw we have class int. We also have something like class string and let's go here and then we have something like class list. So these are the types of all of these objects and this type defines how these objects can interact in the program. For example, watch what happens when I try to add X and Y. When I do this, notice it tells me that I cannot add an int and a string. Now, the reason why this error message is important is because it's telling me, hey, these two objects are different types, and I do not know how to add these two types together. I don't know how to add an int and a string. I only know how to add an int and a float or two ints or two floats. I can't add a string to an int. And the way it's telling me that is based on what type these objects are. Whereas if I try to do something like X plus S, X plus X, sorry, we don't get any errors because, well, these are valid types. So I'm just trying to really make you understand that all of these are objects. All of these pieces of data we have are objects, which are instances of a specific type. 
And that type is defined by the class, which is kind of a blueprint laying out the behavior of all of these objects. So another thing I want to look at is some methods. So previously we saw that we could do something like y dot and let's just go with upper. Now notice that this dot upper, this is known as a method. Anything that you call with the dot operator after a variable or after a specific type and then has the parentheses like this, whether you're taking in some values or not, is known as a method. And so here I'm calling y dot upper and we see that this is going to give me the string in all uppercase. Now my question is, why does this work? Why can I use dot upper on the string, but I can't use it on the int? Well, again, it says the int object has no attribute upper. Really, you could replace this with method. Doesn't make a huge difference. But the point being is that this method only works on objects that are of type string. And the reason for that is the class that defines a string defines this upper method and allows me to use it on the string. Whereas an int, it doesn't have a dot upper method. And so I can't use dot upper on my int. So hopefully this is starting to clarify things a little bit, but the type of objects is very, very important. And that's why we focus so heavily on them previously. Now, just to expand the examples we're going through here, I want to show you that almost everything in Python is an object. So let's look at a function. I'm going to say define func and let's just print hello. Now watch what happens if I print out the type of func. Now notice I'm not calling func, okay? For me to call the function, I would need to have the two parentheses. I'm not calling it, I'm just looking at its name. So if I look at its name and I run this, notice I get class function. So I'm not gonna get into this too much because it is a little bit complicated, but even functions are objects. Seems weird, but func here, this is an object of class function. And the reason why I can return something from this function or do something inside of this function is because the class, the type of this object defines the accepted behavior of it. OK, that's really all you need to understand is that the class or the type of an object is a blueprint describing how it behaves in our program. And for now, we've looked at a bunch of different types. We've looked at strings, lists, dictionaries. Uh, we've looked at floats. We've looked at Booleans, all of these different types. And so that's why we focus so heavily in the previous section on the type of all of these different pieces of data and of these objects, because the type, the class of these objects defines how they behave in our program. That's why we had such a heavy focus on the data types and specifically what type our objects are. OK. So now that we've seen that, what I want to do is just go through a few core pieces of vocabulary just to make sure it's really clear on what those mean, because we're going to be using them a lot as we go through the rest of this section. So the first thing I want to discuss is what an instance is. So an instance is really the existence of an object of a specific class. So let's clear all of this. When I do something like x equals one, I am creating an instance of the int class with a value one. So this is a new instance. And the reason it's a new instance is because when I well, type an int like this, I'm just creating a new instance of the int class. That's how it works. When you define a number like this, you're making a new instance of the int class. And now this is an object of class int, and that defines how this can interact. So that's why we can add this number, subtract this number and do all of the other things that we can do with ints. OK, now let's continue when I go Y and I make this a string. I've just created an instance of the class string. So this is a new object, which is an instance of class string, and it has the value. Hello. OK, just create an instance. Same thing. We'll do another list. We've just created an instance of the class list. This is an object. So that's kind of what I mean by an instance, something that is a specific type. It's an instance of this type. We can have multiple instances of the same type, right? If I go like X2, I've just created another instance of the int class, which has value two. These are not the same because they both have the value two. These are different distinct objects, both instances of the int class. OK, so now that we have seen that, let's talk about methods. So I've said this a few times, but I want to really clear up what a method is. So a method is kind of a function that you call on the instance of a class. So let's say st is equal to string. I showed you that an example of a method is something like dot upper. Now, the reason why 
this is a method is because this is a function that acts on an instance of a class. In this case, this is an instance of class string. And this dot upper method is acting on this instance and doing something. In this case, it's giving us back the string with all uppercase. OK, dot lower. This is also a method. It's acting on this instance. OK, if we go like one, two, three, and then we do dot, let's say index. This is a method. It's acting on an instance of the list class. OK, so those are what methods are. Usually there's the dot operator. And then you have what the name of the method is. Then you have your parentheses and any arguments you're passing to the method. OK, that is method. And lastly, we have classes. Now, so far, we haven't really seen classes because they've kind of been hidden. But something like int, this is actually a class. Something like float, this is a class. Something like bool, this is a class. And the reason these are classes is because these are the types of our instances, right? I'm creating an instance of the type int. I'm creating an instance of the type float. And so the classes are really the different types that we have in our program. So anything that is a type, like a list, like a dictionary, like a set, those are all really classes. We have class int, class set, class dict, OK? Those are all of our classes. And they are the blueprints defining the behavior of all of the instances of that type. OK, so with that said, that pretty much covers everything I need to give you in this introduction. I'm sure a few things are still confusing. Not everything's crystal clear. But as we go into the next lesson and start creating our own classes, you'll really understand what I mean by this class being a blueprint notion and what I mean by instantiating or creating instances of classes, creating new objects. Anyways, with that said, I am going to conclude the video here. I hope you learned something and I look forward to seeing you in another programming expert lesson. Hello, everybody, and welcome to programming expert. In this video, I'll be covering creating classes. So in the previous video, the introduction to object oriented programming, I talked a bit about what objects are, what classes are, what instances are, and how a class really defines kind of all of the behavior that an object is capable of. It acts as a blueprint for all of the objects that are instances of that class or instances of that type. So remember, all of our types, all of our data types are really just classes. And those classes contain the blueprint for how all instances of those classes will behave. So how all of the objects in our program can behave and interact with each other. Anyways, I want to get started here by actually showing you how we can create our own class. So let's start by creating a very simple class. And then I'll show you all of the different things that we need to know related to creating classes. So I'm going to say class. This is the keyword in Python you use when you want to define or create a new class. And I'm going to give my class a name. Now, for now, we can have a super simple class name and just make this person. Now, the convention when you are naming classes is to have what's known as Pascal case. Now, Pascal case means that you're going to have a capital on the first word and then a capital on any subsequent word. So let's say we had person one. This would not be a good class name, but this is how we would name it. So it's kind of like camel case, except the very first character is always capital. It's known as Pascal case. So if we wanted to have like big car, we would do it like that. OK, and if we had a third word, then we would just capitalize the next word as well. OK, so let's name our class person. Now, just like a function, we're going to put our colon here and then I'm going to put pass. Now we have just created a class. That's it. This is all you need to do to create a class. Now we have a new data type in our program known as person. But the thing is, remember, I said that the class is a blueprint defining how objects of this type can behave. And right now we haven't put anything inside of this blueprint. And so person can't really do anything. However, I will show you how we can create a new person object. Again, it won't really be able to do anything. It's a pretty useless object right now, but we can actually create an instance of the class person. So the way we would do that is the following. We'd create a variable, maybe something like P1, and we can make this equal to person with two parentheses. So let's just print out P1 and see if this actually works. OK, so let's run this and notice that we get the main dot person object at some random gibberish location. So this here is your memory address for this object. But notice it's telling me that, OK, this is a person object at this location. Now, the underscore underscore main underscore underscore just denotes that this class is defined inside of the main file. 
Now, the main file in Python is really just the file that you run. So it's the file that you execute that's known as the main file. Anyways, you don't need to know too much about that, but I just want to show you this is how you create an instance of the class person. Now, let's see what happens if I print out the type of person. Well, if I do this, then what happens is I get class main dot person. So it tells me this is of type this class that we define. So this is not an int, it's not a string, it's not a float, it is of type person. And now I want to show you how we can start adding some functionality to this person class so that it's actually useful. So usually when we create an instance of a class, we want to have some information or some data associated with this instance. For example, if we make a list, well, the data associated with our list is the elements inside of the list, right? And then we can get the length of the list. We can try to look for specific elements in the list. There's all kinds of things that we can do, but this list has some data in it. Now we could even make an empty list. That's fine, but we can also add values into it. And if we make an integer, well, we give this a value, right? Value three. If we make a string, we put some content inside of this string. So how can we do this with our person class? Well, let's say that every time we create a person, we actually want to have a name associated with this person. How would we go about implementing that functionality? Well, this is going to look a little bit complex right now, but I'm going to talk to you now about initializing a class and defining what's known as the class constructor. So I'm just going to write out the syntax for this and I'll step through it step by step. So inside of this class, I'm going to define a method. Now, this method is two underscores init and then followed by two underscores. So make sure you have the two underscores here. And this is known as a dunder method. The reason it's called a dunder method is because this is a double underscore method. OK, now inside of here, the first argument that I need to pass or the first parameter, sorry, that I need to have is known as self. Now we'll discuss what self in is a self. Now we'll discuss what self is in a minute. But for now, inside of this class, I'm just going to print out ram just so that we have some output and I can show you how this works. So this method right here is a special method in Python. And the reason it's a method is because it's something that's called on the instance of a class. And actually what happens is this method will run whenever we create a new instance of a class. So when I do something like P1 equals person, remember this is how we create a new instance of the person class. And this is different because these are our custom classes that we've made. What's going to happen is this init method is going to run. And so we should see when I run this, that ran prints out. What happens is we initialize this class, we create a new instance of it. And so the init method runs and then we print out ran. Great. But the thing is, we can do more in this init method. We can actually take some parameters in this init method that are required to initialize a new object of this type. So let me just go here and put X. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to print X. So watch what happens when I run this now. Notice we get an error. It says init missing one required positional argument X. So when we run this line right here, it's calling this init method and all of the parameters here are going to be equal to whatever arguments we put inside of these parentheses. And so I need to put something like two here to fill in a value for X. So just watch what happens when I run this. Notice that we get two. So I'm actually passing this two right here to this init method as the parameter X and we're printing out X. Again, we'll get to the self keyword in just a minute, but for now you can ignore. It. So this is what happens when you initialize an object. You can take in some parameters and then you need to pass those parameters when you initialize or create a new instance of person. So let's continue now and let's look at P2. And let's make P2 and this will be person. And this time we'll just pass a three. So now when I run the code, notice I get two and I get three. So for each instance, we passed a different value for X. OK, so now hopefully we have a basic idea of how this init method works. But whenever you create a new instance of the class, again, you do it in this way. You write the class name and then the two parentheses. You need to pass any of the parameters inside of the init method, except for the self parameter. You can kind of imagine that gets passed automatically and then you can initialize the object. However, right now we're not really doing anything with X. We're just printing out X. What I actually want to do is store X. And now I'm going to talk to you about something called attributes. So first of all, I'm going to change this to say name and inside of here, I'm going to say self dot name is equal to name and I'm just going to fill this in and then I'll explain what I'm doing. OK, so what I've just done here inside of this method is I've created an attribute. 
Now, an attribute is data associated with an instance of an object. OK, so we are creating the name attribute. And what's going to happen now is every time we create a new instance of the person class, we're going to make a new attribute called name and we're going to store whatever the name is that we passed in in this attribute. So now we need to talk about what this self keyword is. So self is a parameter that needs to be in all of your methods, but especially this init method. And this references the instance of the class. So you can kind of think of self as being P1 or self being P2. So we are actually accessing the instance ourself that this method is acting on and creating a new attribute on that instance called name, which is equal to name. So P1's name is different than P2 name, right? Person one has a different name than person two. So let me just show you this and then we'll get into this in more detail. So I'm going to just print P1.name and I'm going to print P2.name. And when I run this, notice that each of them have a different name. So first of all, this worked. This code is totally valid, but we have created now a new instance of the person type. So now we have an instance. This instance, we can kind of name it P1 and it has a name of Tim. And then P2 has a name of Bill. And notice that if I print P1 name again, well, these are different, right? P1 name did not change just because we created a new person. Both of these instances have different names. They have different values for their attributes. So just to walk through this slowly one more time, this self parameter is automatically passed to this method. We don't need to pass it. And it contains the instance that we're calling this method on. So in this case, the instance is this. So P1, right? And then we say self.name. So the instance dot name, we're making a new attribute. This is what this is known as, is equal to whatever name we passed in. That's it. That's all we need to do. So now let me show you how we can make more attributes. So I want to make an attribute called age. So I'm going to say age like this. So now that I've done this, I also need to pass an age when I'm initializing my objects. So let's go with 21 and 40. And now when I run this, notice no errors. Everything works totally fine. But now P1 has a name and it has an age and P2 has a name and it has an age as well. These are attributes on these instances. Now to access the attributes I showed you, we can do something like P1.name. And after this, let's do P1.age. So I just write what the name of the attribute is and I can access the value stored in that attribute. So now I have Tim and I have 21. And if I go and we swap this to P2, then you'll see that we'll get Bill and we'll get 40 and we get that. OK, so now what I'm going to show you is that we can modify these attributes from outside of the class. Now, this is not something that I generally recommend that you do. There's specific use cases where this is kind of preferred or allowed. So usually don't do this unless you need to or you're asked to do this. But I just want to show you that we can modify the value of the attributes here outside of the class or create new attributes as well. So remember that I told you what this self keyword is, is access to this instance. And so we're saying whatever the instance is dot name is equal to name, whatever the instance is dot age is equal to age. So if I can do it using the self keyword, I can do it using the instance itself. I can do something like P1 dot new. We'll just call it dot new actually is equal to random. OK, I'm just making a new attribute and now I can go down here and print p1 dot new and notice that this is totally fine. I just created a new attribute called new and then I just accessed it and printed out and it was storing a string. So that's fine. I can make a new attribute. What I also can do is change an existing attribute. So let's say name exists here. We now say p1 dot name equals random and let's go down here and print out p1 dot name. Notice now it's equal to random. There you go. That is how you modify attributes or create new ones outside of the class. And again, the reason that works is because all self is is access to the attribute itself. And so if we can say self dot name equals name, we can say P1 dot name equals random. That, that's the exact same thing. We're just not doing it inside of the class. OK, hopefully this is starting to make a bit of sense. But let me just stop now, do a quick recap and really discuss everything we've done so far. So we have created a new class. This class is called person. And this now is a new data type in our program. OK. This is a new thing that instances can be of. They can be of type person. 
Then what we did is we created our initialization, so our init method. This is a special method in Python, and we don't need to manually call init. I don't need to go underscore underscore init like that. What happens is this will automatically be called whenever we create a new instance. So when I create a new instance, I do it like this. I write the name of the class. I put my parentheses, and then I pass any values required to initialize this instance. In this case, what's required is name and age. So I pass Tim and 21. And what happens is I say, OK, this instance now has an attribute called name, which is equal to name. And it has an attribute called age, which is equal to age. And these attributes are specific to the instance, not to the class. So each instance here has a different name and a different age. They cannot modify each other's attributes. So P2 does not modify P1's attributes and P1 does not modify P2's attributes. They are different, they're unique, and they're within the instance, not within the class. And that's all we've done so far. That is how you create classes and that is how you create attributes. All right, so now that we've looked at this, I just want to do one more example to make sure it's really clear. So let's scrap all of this and let's make a new class with some different attributes. Feel free to pause the video and try this without me. And then obviously I will go through and explain how we do this. So what I want to do is I want to create, let's go with a fruit class. And I want this fruit class to contain attributes, or I want each instance of this fruit class, sorry, to contain an attribute that has the name of the fruit and the number of calories that the fruit has. OK, just a simple example, we want the name and the number of calories that each fruit has. So fruit class name and calories. Go ahead, try to create this if you want. If you're not able to do so, don't worry, I'm going to write it right now. So I'm going to say class fruit. Notice the capitalization. I'm capitalizing the first word like this. And inside of here, I'm going to create my initialization. So I'm going to say define a nip. I'm going to pass self. Make sure you pass self. You need to pass self as the first argument here or first parameter here. Sorry. Now you can name this something else, but you should name itself. So just name itself for now. Uh, we're not going to mess around with changing the name of this. And now I'm going to put name and I'll just go with cows like that. So rather than typing out calories, we'll just say cows or actually, you know what? We can go with calories. That's fine. So now inside of here, I'm going to say self dot name is equal to name and self dot calories is equal to calories. And that's it. I've created this class. OK, now the class is created. Every time I want to initialize a fruit, what I need to do is pass a name and calories, and then I will create these two attributes. So the name attribute and the calories attribute. Now what I want you to do is initialize or create a new instance of the fruit class. I want this to be an apple and I want it to have, let's say, 100 calories. So how would we do that? Well, I'll just go with a is equal to fruit. And then I will pass the name as Apple and I will pass as calories 100. OK, so I've now created an instance of the fruit class. We have a name Apple and calories 100. Now let's make a new attribute on this instance and we'll do that outside of the class. Now this new attribute, let's go with color. OK, so I'm going to say a.color is equal to red. So now this Apple has the color red. There you go. We've just created a class define the initialization. We then created a new instance of this class. This is an apple that has 100 calories and we've given it the color red. Perfect. OK, so now that we've done all of this, I want to wrap up this video by talking about the purpose of classes. Why have we, why have I just showed you this? When are we going to use classes and how do you create good classes? Now, in all honesty, we don't know enough about classes yet to really see the true meaning behind them. But the point of a class is to define or store really common behavior between instances. So when we look at something like an int or we look at something like a string, these are all unique, right? The string could have different characters. The int can be a different value, but they all act the same. They all have the same behavior. Ints gets added to ints, right? Ints can be rounded or not rounded, but floats can be rounded. Sorry. Strings can have a length to them. Strings have methods that we can use on them. Even though the strings different or the ints different, they all share some common behavior. So what these classes do is they encapsulate all of the common behavior between instances in one place. So now whenever you want a specific type of behavior, you create an object of a specific class so of a certain type and you have access to all of that different type of behavior. That's really the purpose of classes. So in our example here, we have a fruit class. Now, again, it seems pretty useless right now, but what we've done is we've encapsulated some behavior in this class. The behavior is we want all of our fruits to have a name and to have calories. So now every time we want to create a new fruit, it's very simple. 
we just do this. We know that what we're referencing is of type fruit. And then maybe later on, we make it so fruits can interact with each other, or we have a fruit basket that holds multiple fruits. Hopefully, you're kind of getting the idea here. But we're encapsulating common behavior between instances of specific types into this class. And that's a word you'll hear a lot encapsulation or encapsulate. That's all it means. We're taking a bunch of related behavior and grouping it together, in this case, in something like a class. OK, so hopefully that's somewhat answered the question on why we would use classes. But as we continue to learn more about them, you will see really where their use cases are. So with that said, I am going to conclude the video here. I hope you learned something. and I look forward to seeing you in another Programming Expert lesson. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Programming Expert. In this video, I'll be covering methods. Now, a method is really a function that acts on an instance of a class. Now, these methods are special because unlike functions, they can actually access all of the attributes associated with a specific instance. Anyways, let me go ahead and show you how we can make our own methods. So let's start by defining a class. Let's make a simple person class. And for our person class, let's have an initialization which requires a name. So let's go self name and let's go self dot name is equal to name. So now all of our instances will have a name attribute and they'll be initialized with that when they are created. OK, so let's actually create an instance of this person class. Let's say P1 is equal to person and we'll go with my name, which is Tim. OK, great. So all of this works. We've seen this before. Now what I want to do is show you how we can make a method. So recall that this here is actually a method. This is a special method. This is the initialization method, but this is actually a method. And we could actually call this method. Uh, you shouldn't do this, but you can call this method like this. So we could actually call it like this. That'd be fine. However, we're not going to do that. Anyways, point being to make a method, what you do is you put the def keyword inside of your class, so indented, and then you define the name of the method. So you pretty much create a function inside of the class. So I'm going to say define. And for this method, I'm going to say, say hello. And all this is going to take is self as its parameter. Now, all of your methods require that self is the first parameter inside of them. And that is because they act on an instance of a class. Self stores that instance. And so you always need self as the very first parameter. And you can kind of think of this as a hidden parameter, something that you don't need to explicitly pass to the method, but that will be passed automatically when you use the method. Anyways, we have say hello. And all I'm going to do inside of say hello is I'm going to print an F string and then hello, comma, and then self dot name. So what I'm doing here is I'm accessing the name attribute of whatever instance this method is being called on, and I am printing it out. I'm saying hello, and then whatever the name is. So let's go here and let's call this method. To call the method, we simply write the name of the method. So we have dot, and then the name of the method. And if this accepted any more parameters other than self, we would need to pass those. So if we said, say hello, and we had an x there, we would need to pass some value for x, very similar to how the init method works. OK, let's run this and see if this works. So I run this code and notice we get hello, comma, Tim. Perfect. So now let's make another instance and let's make sure this works for our other instance. So let's go with Susan and let's go P2 dot say hello. And let's see what we get. We get hello, Tim and hello, Susan. So this method is indeed working. OK, so now that we've done this, let's make a new method. And this method, I actually want to add a new attribute to our class. So I'm going to say define add underscore attribute. Uh, and actually, let's change this. Let's create this and make it equal to set. And let's go with age. OK, so I'm going to take self and I'm going to take an age. And inside of here, I'm going to say self dot age is equal to age. So now I've defined a new method. You could call this method a setter. The reason you would call this a setter is because it's setting the value of an attribute. And all this is doing is taking an age, and it's then creating a new attribute called age and associating that with whatever the age is that we added in. So let's try this method now. Uh, let's go p1 dot set underscore age. Let's set it to 21, and then let's print out p1 dot age. And let's see what we get. And notice we get 21. 
Perfect. So that's an example of another method that is our setter. Now, in the same way that we have what's known as setter methods, sometimes we have getter methods. Now, we're going to look at this more in the next video, but a getter method is a method that gives you the value of an attribute. Now, in Python, these are redundant. You do not need these. And the reason you don't need them is because you can access the attribute directly by just referencing age like we've done here. But in other programming languages, sometimes you will see something like this. Define get underscore age. And this will take in self. And this will simply return self.age. So now if I were to replace p1.age with get underscore age, and I would run this, notice that we get the same thing. Okay, so I just want to show you a few examples of methods. Just like functions, we can return values from them. You can treat these exactly like functions, except they have access to the attributes of whatever instance they're being called on. And that means that these are instance methods. Again, the reason they're instance methods is because they all take in self, they all have access to the instance, and they act on an instance of the class. Great. Okay, so now that we have this, I just want to talk a little bit about this setter and getter method uh, and kind of describe why what I've done here is not really the best practice. So notice that I've created a method that defines a new attribute. Now, this in principle is okay, it's fine to do this. But the reason why I'm going to advise you don't create attributes in this way in kind of a method like this is because if you do this and you try to access these attributes later, they need to have already been created. So let me show you what I mean, but let's remove everything that we have right here and let me call p1.get underscore age. I'm just going to call it. I'm not even going to print it out. Let's just run it and notice I get an error. It says the person object has no attribute age. The reason I got this error is because I tried to access the self.age attribute before I had created it. And so with this set age method, I need to make sure I call this before I call get age. And right now, there's no way that I can really enforce that that happens. So what I should do instead is I should define up here in my initialization self.age. Now, I don't necessarily need to make this equal to an age parameter like this. I don't need to require that upon initialization, I pass an age, but I should define the attribute and give it some default value. And in fact, a good default value would be none. So I'm putting all of the attributes up here in my initialization that I plan to use in the future but that have not yet actually been instantiated. I haven't given them a real value. I mean, none is not really a real value. And so now what happens if I try to access get age is I no longer get an error. And the reason I don't get an error is because I have self.age. And even though it doesn't have kind of a valid number, it's given none. And so now we don't have that error occurring here. So hopefully that kind of makes sense. But at least for me, I really like to define all of my attributes inside of the initialization. And if I'm not yet using the attribute, if I'm not assigning it to the name of a parameter, then what I'm going to do is give it a default value like none or some default value that makes sense, right? So we could have something like maybe a weight and maybe a height, right? So if that's the case, maybe I initialize these with zero just to say, OK, for right now, we haven't given a weight. I mean, I could also give it a none, but I'm just showing you that I want to add all of my attributes in the init here, even if they're not yet being used so that if I do try to access them in the future, I don't get an error. And so now what I can do is something like P1 dot set underscore age, and I can set this equal to let's go with 24 and then I can print this out and we'll notice that all is working as we would expect we get 24. OK, so that's kind of the basics on setters and getters. A setter is really a method that takes in some values or one value and assigns that to an attribute or creates a new attribute. And then a getter is something that gives you the value of an attribute. Again, in Python, these are unnecessary because I can just access the age like this. I don't need to use get age or set age. But in the next video, you'll see why we might use something similar to this that we're going to call a property. OK, so now that we've done that, what I want to do is just go through a few examples. So I'm going to delete everything that we have here and let's make a new class that has some methods that actually make sense. They're actually going to do something. So let's call this class maybe counter. So let's go class counter like this. Now, I want to set up an initialization. And for this initialization, I just want to have a very simple kind of counting object. And this object will store the count, right? So we could start counting at a specific number and then count up and count down. And all this object is going to do for us or all this class is going to do for us is just keep track of what the current count is. And so I have to ask myself here, do I want the user 
to have to pass me something to initialize my counter? Should we start at a specific value or should we just initialize it at zero? Now, in this case, I'm just going to initialize it at zero. So I'm going to say self dot count is equal zero inside of my initialization. So now whenever you create a counter, you don't need to pass anything to it, but it will just define this attribute self dot count. And well, it will have this being equal to zero by default unless you decide to change it. Now, what I'm going to do is make two methods. One method that lets me count up and one that lets me count down. And when I say count up, all this method is going to do is increase the count by one. When I say count down, it will decrease the count by one. So I'm going to say define count up. I mean, really, I could call this increment. That's probably a better method. So let's take self and let's go with self dot count plus equals one. So let's just add one to our count. Then we'll go with decrement. So decrement like that. We'll take in self. We'll say self dot count minus equals one. OK, so now we have a very basic counter. And what I want to do is make one more method. And I want this method to actually print out what the current count is. So I'm going to say define. I will just say print count. And then what this method will do is just print out the count. So we'll say print f string. The current count is self dot count. OK, so a basic class. Let's initialize it now. We're going to say counter is equal to counter. And then we're going to say counter dot increment counter dot uh, decrement and then counter dot print count. And let's just repeat this. And this time I'm just going to increment two more times. OK, so let's just see what our output is here. When I run this, we get the current count is zero and then the current count is two. So we're going to increment the counter, decrement it. So the counter would go from zero to one to zero, then we print it. So it's zero. Then we increment twice. So then it's two when we print it out. Very basic counter class. Now I want to make this a bit more complicated and I want to add a lock. So I want to have an attribute that tells me whether or not I can increment or decrement the counter. And only if this attribute is unlocked, so it's telling us, OK, we can increment or decrement, will we allow that to happen? So I'm going to say self dot locked equals false. And now what I'm going to do is make a method called lock. I'm going to say define lock. And actually, let's call this toggle lock. And this will take in self. And what this will do is toggle the lock. So if the lock is false, then we'll make it true. If it's true, then we'll make it false. So if it's locked, we'll unlock it. If it's unlocked, we'll make it locked. So what I'm going to do here is I am going to say self dot locked is equal to not self dot locked. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because this will simply swap whatever the value of this Boolean variable is. So if it's false, it will go to true. If it's true, it will go to false. Now, some people would have done something like this. If self dot locked is equal to true, then self dot locked is equal to false. And then they would go else self dot locked is equal to true. That's fine. You can do this, but notice that this is much cleaner and easier to read, in my opinion. And so we're just going to leave it like this. Now, though, inside of my increment and my decrement, I'm going to make it so that we aren't going to increment or decrement if we are locked. And actually, what I'll make happen is an error or an exception will be raised if we try to increment or decrement when we are locked. So I'm going to say if self dot locked then what I want to do is raise and we'll just raise a exception, a general exception, and we'll say the counter is locked exclamation point. OK, I'm going to copy this. I'm going to put it inside of decrement. Perfect. So now let's try our counter. So we need a way to toggle the lock. So let's do all of this. And then after we print out the count, in fact, let's increment a bunch of times. Then we'll decrement once, then we'll print out the count. And then what I will try to do is lock it. So I'll say counter dot toggle lock. And then after this, we'll just try to decrement. OK, so let's try this now. Let's see what we get. So notice we get the current count is two. And then it says the counter is locked. So we raise that exception because, well, we locked the counter and we cannot increment or decrement because the counter is locked. So hopefully this example has been decent and showed you how we can work with different types of methods. Notice that none of these methods return anything, but we could return something from them like I showed you previously. Most of these are actually modifying an attribute on this object, right? These instance methods, again, they're called instance methods because they act on the instance, all take in our self parameter. 
then they have access to all of these attributes. So in this case, we are locking or we're toggling the lock. Here, we're looking at the lock, we're incrementing the counter, we're decrementing the count, we're printing out the count, we're doing something on the attributes of this class. Now, just to go into one more example here, let's see what happens if we make a second counter. So I can actually say uh, counter two is equal to counter. Now, remember, both of these counters are different. So if I lock one counter, that doesn't mean that the other one is locked. So just to show you this, if I do something like counter dot toggle lock and then I say counter two dot increment and let's just go counter one or counter dot print count and counter two dot print count, you'll see that we are able to increment counter two even if we lock counter one because the attributes are different, right? So just wanted to really emphasize that again, that each one of these counter instances have different values for these attributes. And one of these methods does not affect the attributes on a different instance. It only affects the attributes on the instance it's acting on, on this self object, right? Okay, so with that said, that's really all I need to show you related to methods. Methods work the exact same way that functions work, except they act on an instance of a class. And I'm going to keep repeating that because it's very important that you understand that this self keyword is referring to the instance the method is acting on. If you want to create methods, create them just like you would make a function, except make sure the very first attribute is always self, and then you need to indent these and put them inside of the class. There are lots of different use cases for methods, and we will continue to see more and more of them as we go through this section. With that said, I am going to conclude the video here. I hope this was helpful, and I look forward to seeing you in another Programming Expert lesson. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Programming Expert. In this video, I'll be covering properties. Now, properties are really special attributes that we can have on our instances and on our classes that make it so that we can enforce specific behavior when we are accessing or trying to modify an attribute. And this is going to seem really abstract and weird right now. But let me go through an example and show you kind of a problem that occurs with our traditional attributes and then show you how a property can fix it. So I'm going to make a class. I'm going to say class person. And inside of here, I'm going to define an init. So I'm going to say init self name. And then we'll say self dot name is equal is equal to name. OK, so very basic initialization. Now, what I'm also going to do is make a salary and say self dot salary is equal to zero. Now, we're going to stop for one second and I'm going to go off course a little bit and just talk to you about the proper naming of classes. So this is something I should have probably mentioned in a previous lesson, but I'm going to talk about it now. So I told you before, when you name your classes, you want to have Pascal case. So you want to have a capital on the first word and capital on any subsequent words. But I didn't tell you how to pick what this word is. Now, some classes are very intuitive and easy to decide the name of. Others are more difficult. But just like a variable, you want your class names to be meaningful. And remember that your class name is the type of all of the instances. This is the best way to think about what to name your classes. Every single one of your instances needs to be one of whatever your class name is. So if I name my class person, all of my instances should be of type person, right? So you need to make sure that that rule kind of applies, that all of your instances are whatever the class name is. Now, a common mistake is people will name their class something plural, like persons. Now, the reason this is incorrect is because each of my instances are not multiple people. They are one person. So even though this class will have a bunch of instances of it, that doesn't mean I name it plural. I still want it to be singular, right? I can have multiple integers. I have one, two, three, and I have a bunch of integers, but my class is not named int. It's named int. And again, the reason it's named int is because every instance is of type int. They are not multiple ints, right? So hopefully that makes sense, but I just wanted to point that out. Do not name your classes something plural unless your instances are plural, right? Unless each instance is actually multiple things, and that's very rare. Generally speaking, do not name your classes something plural unless you have a very specific reason to do that. OK, so moving forward, we have self.salary. Now, we saw previously that we can modify the salary however we want. So let's make an instance. Let's say p equals person. Let's go with Tim. I can do something like p dot salary equals negative 100. And there's no way to really stop me from doing this. I can just write this, and this works. The issue with this is I shouldn't have a negative salary, right? Probably doesn't make sense for someone to have a negative salary. And I really want it so that my salary 
cannot be a negative value. But right now, there's no way for me to enforce that because outside of the class, I can just go here and I can just change the salary. So one way to fix this is to make this what's known as a private attribute. Now, a private attribute is simply an attribute that has an underscore prefixing its name. Now, in traditional object oriented programming, a private attribute is an attribute that can only be modified and accessed from inside of the class. So it has to be inside of this class body here. It could be in a method. It could be wherever, but it has to be inside the class. I can't do something like this with a private attribute. The reason we call it private is because it's not accessible to anything outside of the class. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, the opposite of a private attribute would be a public attribute. So name would be a public attribute because I can access it outside of the class. Now, the thing is, in Python, we don't actually have a real notion of a private attribute. This underscore here is simply a convention to denote that something should be private, but it doesn't actually enforce that it's private. What I mean by that is I can still access the attribute. I can still do this. There's no issues, right? Like no errors occur. This is fine. I can do that in the same way. I could access the salary and just print it out. So if I do this, it's fine. So the thing is, in Python, we kind of assume that people are going to, let's say, follow the rules or follow the conventions. And when you put an underscore, that means don't do this. It's pretty much saying, hey, I know you can do it, but since we don't actually have this real notion of private, I'm telling you with this underscore that this is private and you shouldn't access it. So in that case, we're going to be good. We're not going to access it. And we're going to say, OK, this is a private attribute. So now that we've made this a private attribute, that's fine. We're going to imagine that we can't change this outside of the class. Again, we can, but just remember, we're going to kind of follow the rules in the convention and we're not going to actually change it. So now if I want to modify this, what I need to do is make a setter. I need to make a method that allows me to modify it. So I'm going to say define set underscore salary. OK, and then it's going to be self salary like that. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say self dot salary is equal to salary. And sorry, this should be underscore salary. So now inside of my setter, I'm accessing the private attribute and assigning it a new value. So here, this will be a good point where I could actually put in that check where I make sure the salary is positive. So I'm going to say if salary is less than zero, then I'll just raise an exception to tell my user actually we will raise a value error to tell whoever is using this class, hey, this is invalid. Exclamation point. OK, so now we have an exception if you try to use a negative salary. So let's just test this. Let's say P dot set salary and let's set it to negative five or negative 15. Let's run it and notice we get, hey, this is invalid. And then if I try to set this to like 100, this should work. Perfect. OK, so we have that. This is fine. But the thing is, I still would really like to be able to access my salary using salary like that. And I would really like to be able to change it by doing something like P dot salary equals 100. But then the same issue will occur, right? Then I would be able to modify this and make it a negative value. There's nothing stopping me from doing that. Well, this is where properties come in. So what I need to do is make a getter here and then I'll show you how we set up a property. So I'm going to say get underscore salary self. And what I want to do is every time I get my salary, I actually want to return the rounded version of the salary just in case someone gives me a float. So I'm going to say return, not rerun, return. If I could type this properly, self dot underscore salary and we're going to round this. OK, so round like that. OK, so all of this is valid. We can access this private attribute inside of the class. That's fine. So now if I want to set my salary, I use dot set salary. And if I want to get it, I use dot get salary. But like I was saying before, instead of this, instead of using these methods, I want to make it so I can do something like P dot salary equals 100. But I still want to have these checks. I still want to make sure that the salary is not negative, And I still want to round my salary when I return it to the user or to whoever's calling. So what I need to do now is create a property. So there's a few ways to create a property. I'm going to show you the first kind of legacy way, and then I will show you kind of the new and preferred version. So to make a property, you can do the following. You can say the name of the property is equal to this property function, and then you can put the getter and the setter associated with your property. So again, a property, just a special attribute. I want my attribute to be named salary but I want to avoid allowing people to directly modify the salary without going through the checks that I've set up. And so I made this private attribute and I said, OK, this will actually store what the salary is. 
And then I'll have this set salary and get salary method, but it's kind of annoying to have to use these methods. So instead, I'm going to set up a property. So now that I set up the property, what this allows me to do is P not salary is equal to 100. So let's just do something like this print P dot salary. So now when I do this, this works fine. And if I try to update this to negative 100, notice I get an error. So what this does is it combines the getter and the setter together and uses it when you perform these operations. So when I do something like equals 100, what actually occurs is this method will be called with P, so with what self is, and with what the salary is, so negative 100 as the parameter. It will run through this and it will update the salary if it's supposed to, and it will raise an error if I have a negative salary. And then when I get the salary, so let's update this to be like 101.11111, okay? Now when I get the salary, same thing, I get it rounded. So rather than actually just giving me the value of this attribute, it runs the get salary method and whatever this return result is, that's what I get. So this is kind of a little magical thing that you can use this property function. You don't have to understand exactly how the property function itself works, but you pass first the getter and then the setter associated with your private attribute. You name this property, whatever you want. In this case, I want salary. And now I use salary to access this attribute. Hopefully that makes sense, but that's how you can kind of shield against uh, people modifying your attributes from outside of the class. And again, we're calling this a private attribute. It's not really private. I can actually still access this outside of the class, but we know that when we have an underscore, we're going to consider it private. So the convention is don't access it or don't modify it outside of the class. So that's the first way to make a property. So now that I've showed you this way, I'm going to show you kind of the old or sorry, not the old. I'm going to show you the new and preferred way. So the new way to create this property is to use something known as a decorator. Now, when you do this, you need to put your getter above your setter. Okay. So the getter is going to go up here and you need to name your getter method, the name of your property. In this case, I'm naming it salary. So above here, what I do is I put what's known as a decorator. I put at and then property. Whenever you see an at above a function, it's known as a decorator. This is the at property decorator. You don't have to know what this means. We have a lesson on this in the advanced programming section that describes actually how to make your own decorators. But for now, just understand that what this does is make this a property. OK, make salary a property. So we've done that. This now sets up our getter. So we now have a dot salary getter. All right. And when I try to access the salary, it will give it to me around. However, I need a setter as well. So now what I need to do is decorate the setter method and call this one property. Sorry, not property. Salary dot setter. So I define my property. I say at property. And then this is the name of my property, the name of the method. This method should be my getter. It should return to me the private attribute. Then I have my setter. So whatever the name of my property is, which is salary, I do that. So at salary dot setter. And then I have the setter. So now this will work the exact same way. So if I run this, uh, it says can't set attribute. OK, let me have a look at this. OK, so I made a small mistake here. I need to make sure I call this method the same as what I call my getter. So now when I run this, notice that this works fine. So that was a small mistake here. You need to name both your setter and your getter the same thing. They need to be named whatever the actual property is. In this case, the property name is salary. You still need to decorate it in this fashion, but both methods just need to be named the same thing. OK, so there you go. That is the two different ways to make a property. Now for some practice, let's get rid of this and let's make an entirely new class and define a property and we'll do it a bit quicker this time. All right, so let's set up a class and let's call this class um, time. And this class is just going to store the current second that we are on. Seems a little bit strange, but we'll just make it store second. So we're going to say define underscore underscore init underscore underscore self second. And then I want second to be a property. So I'm going to say self dot underscore second is equal to and then second like that. And what I want to make sure is that my second is never greater than 60 and never less than zero. So I need a property for that. So to do that, I am going to set up my getter and my setter. So I'm going to say define second like that. This will be self and this will be my getter. So all I'm going to do is return self dot underscore second like that. OK, straightforward. That's fine. Now I'm going to make my 
setter. So I'm going to say define second self second. And then I'm going to say if second is less than zero or second is greater than 60, then I want to raise a value error and I'll say invalid exclamation point. Otherwise, I will say self dot underscore second equals second. OK, so I've now set up my getter and my setter. So now I need to define the property. So I'm going to say at property like that. And I'm going to go here and say at second dot setter. OK, so notice I have my private attribute. It's very important that you have this as a private attribute. If you try to do this with a public attribute, you're going to see that it doesn't work. So I do this with a private attribute. I say at property and then I define my getter. OK, then I have my setter and I make sure I have at second, which is the name of my property dot setter. And notice that both my setter and my getter are named the same thing. So now let's set up an instance and say T equals time. Let's make it start at 54 and let's go here and say T dot second equals 100. OK, so if I do this, notice we get invalid. All right. So now let's try to set it to 59. And notice this works fine. So now inside of my second getter, I'm just going to print out run just so we can see that this is actually working. And I'm just going to go here and print T dot second. So we're just going to access it. So if I run this, notice I get run and then I get 59. Perfect. There we go. OK, so that is all I need to show you for properties. Again, you use a property when you want to make sure that an attribute has a specific value based on some constraints. So you want to ensure that anything outside of your class cannot modify this attribute or access this attribute in inappropriately or incorrectly. Right. That is why you use a property. Now, just like we can set up a property using the decorators, we can set it up in the legacy way as well. Now, the preferred way is the way that I just showed you. We also can do this. We can say second is equal to property like this. And then we go second and second. But now that we've done this, we need to name these things something different. So I'm going to say get and set. And then I would need to put my getter first and my setter second. So now that I do this and I run this, we get the exact same result. All right. So with that said, I am going to conclude the video here. I hope this was helpful and I look forward to seeing you in another programming expert lesson. Hello, everybody, and welcome to programming expert. In this video, I'll be covering class methods and class attributes. Now, class attributes and methods differ from instance attributes and instance methods because they act on the class itself, not on the instance. So a class method is specific to the actual class and a class attribute. Same thing is associated with the class. And so it does not have access to any of this instance information. It is solely related to the class, not related to the different instances. Now, this is a little bit vague right now. Let me show you an example so you can see what I mean. So I'm going to say class. Let's make a car class. Now, let's init the car class by just taking a make. So we'll say self uh, make and model of the car. So we'll say self dot make equals make and self dot model equals model. OK, so now we have our car class. And we have an initialization. Now, these are all our instance attributes, right? Instance attributes. This will be an instance method. The reason they're instance is because we're using self. So as soon as we use self, we're accessing something related to the instance. However, what I can do is make a class attribute. So let me show you how we would do this. I'm just going to make an attribute called number of cards like this. I'm going to make this equal to zero. So what I've just done is created a class attribute. The reason it's a class attribute is because it's associated directly with the class, right? I put it inside of the class. I didn't put it inside of a method and I didn't prefix it with self. Now, since I didn't prefix it with self, what that means is that this is not on an instance. It's just associated with the class. And so let me show you here without even making an instance, I can print out car dot number of cars and notice that this works totally fine. So this is how you would access the class attribute. You use the name of the class because this is associated with the class. It is not associated with instances of the class. And so no instances are required for me to access this attribute. Now, in the same way, I can do something like car dot number of cars plus equals three. So let's add three to it. Let's print it out and notice that we get three. OK, that is a class attribute. Now, when you define your class attributes, you make them just like any other attribute. 
They need to be a valid variable name and you put them above all of your methods. So this is kind of the convention. You just define all of your class attributes above all of the different methods that you have. Perfect. OK, so now that we've done this, I'm going to create a few instances of this class and show you that that does not change the value of this attribute. So let's increment number of cars and let's go C1 is equal to car. Let's make this a Ford edge. OK, and with we'll C2 is equal to another car. And this can be a Mazda or Mazda, however you pronounce that. And I'll just go with three. OK, great. So we have two cars created now. And before we said car dot number of cars plus equals three. So when I run this, notice that I still get three. OK, so it didn't change. Creating these instances did not modify this attribute. Now, what I want to show you is that from these instances, I can also access this attribute. So I can do something like C1 dot number of cars. When I do C1 dot number of cars, notice I get three. So this is giving me the class attribute, not the instance attribute. Seems kind of weird, but if I had number of cars as an attribute on my instance, I would get that. But since I don't have that, I'm just getting the class attribute. So I can access the class attribute from instances. It's not preferred to do it this way, but I can, right? I can access this. Now I'll show you that for both of my instances, they have the same value for this class attribute, right? Because we're accessing the class attribute, not the instance attribute. However, now what happens if I go self that number of cars equals one and I run this notice that I get one. So instead of getting three, I'm now getting one. That's because I'm accessing the instance attribute, not the class attribute. OK, now let's look at what happens after if I go print car dot number of cars. So let's run this and notice that now I'm getting three. So both of these are accessing their instance attributes, which are equal to one. But this is accessing the class attribute, which is equal to three. OK, great. So the whole point of this example was actually to write something that could keep track of the number of instances of a class. So what I'm going to do is inside of here, I'm going to say car dot number of cars plus equals one. So now what I'm doing is I'm modifying the class attribute by using the class name and adding one to it every time I create a new instance. So now if I go here and I print C1 dot number of cars, you're going to see that we get two. And the same thing will happen if I print C2 dot number of cars. And the same thing will happen if I print car dot number of cars, right? We'll get the exact same result because these are all referencing the class attribute. Perfect. So that's it. I've now showed you class attributes. Now, the point of the class attribute is to have some information that's associated with every instance of the class. So every instance of the class will have access to this class attribute and can modify this class attribute if it wants. But that will be sustained across all of the instances. So any change to this attribute applies to all of the instances. They all will see this change because this is associated with the class, not with each individual instance. And so for an example, something that you would put as a class attribute is something like this number of cars. You're keeping track of how many instances of the car class exist. Now, another thing you might put as a class attribute is wheels. Maybe I say all cars have four wheels. And so I'm saying wheels equals four. And I'm just defining that every single car has four wheels. That's it. Now, inside of each instance, I could access wheels and I would see that they have four. So anything that is the same for every single instance and that when changed somewhere, you want it to change for every instance you put as a class attribute. Whereas something that's specific to an instance, you make an instance attribute. So hopefully that makes sense. But remember, the class attribute is for the whole class. The instance attributes are for each specific instance. Pretty intuitive, but that is your class attribute. OK, so we've now looked at the class attributes. Next, we are going to look at our class methods. Now, the class methods work very similarly to our class attributes. A class method is a method that acts on the class that does not act on an instance. So the way you make a class method is the following. You say define. Let's just call this um, update number of cars. OK, and here, rather than taking self, we're going to take CLS. And for this specific method, I'm going to take a cars. OK, now all I want this method to do here is to update the number of cars and make it whatever cars is. OK, so I'm just going to say CLS 
dot number of cars is equal to and then cars. Now, this is going to seem weird. But what I've done here is I've created a class method and I also need to add, sorry, this decorator called class method like that. OK, so the class method takes CLS. Now, CLS is a mandatory parameter for any of your class methods, and this stands for the name of the class. This is not the self, right? This is not an instance. This is the name of the class. So CLS will actually reference the car class like this. And then cars is just a parameter that I am passing to this method to update the number of cars with. So inside of here, let me just print run. OK, and I'll show you how we would use this class method. So we use the class method by calling it on the class. So I can do something like, let's go here, car dot update number of cars and update this to 10. So now if I run the code, notice again 10, 10, and 10, and this method ran, or this print statement ran from this method. So it updated this class attribute. So in a class method, you can only access class attributes, things associated with the class. You cannot access any instance attributes inside of here. I cannot access the make and the model of any cars. And the reason for that is I don't know what make or model I'm going to access. I'm not calling this on an instance. I'm calling it on a class. So that is why I only have access to things that are defined as class attributes. Now, I could access other class methods. That would be fine because that's associated with the class. But anything that's an instance attribute or method, I cannot access and cannot use. OK. That is the class method. Now, just to go through the syntax here, at class method is a decorator, just like the at property decorator we saw previously. This just tells us that, hey, this is a class method. So just always put that above your class methods, the at class method decorator, and make sure the first parameter here is always CLS. Now, let's remove this parameter and let's just update this to be five. OK, I just want to show you that this still works. This is kind of the hidden parameter, just like self is. It will pass the name of the class. OK, so the last thing I want to show you is that we can call class methods on instances. Now, when I do this, what's going to happen is CLS is still going to be equal to the name of the class. This is not going to act on an instance just because I call it on an instance. Instead, it will just work the same way it would work if we called it directly on car. So when I run this, same thing happens, right? If I change this to C2. Same thing will happen. Let's run that. All is good. OK, so you can call this on your instances. But remember that you won't have access to anything from the instances. You will only have access to the class name. Perfect. So now that we've seen that, I'm just going to clear this. Let's go through one example and make sure everything is very, very clear. All right, so let's do an example here where we're going to use class attributes and class methods together. So I'm going to say class. I'm going to make a circle class. Now, the point of this class is actually not going to be to create instances of it. The point of it is going to be to group together related methods, OK, and attributes that we want to use. So right now, I'm going to define pi as a class attribute. I'm going to call this 3.14. Now, we could go in more depth. We could use the math module to actually get the value of pi. But for our purpose, we want the rounded version of 3.14. OK, so I'm going to have pi like that. OK, so what I'm going to do is define a method. I'm going to call this method area. And this is going to be a class method. So we're going to say at class method. And this is going to take in a radius. But first, it's going to take in CLS. OK, so it's taking in the class and it's taking in radius. Then what we're going to do is use pi here to calculate the area of a circle. So the area of a circle is going to be equal to CLS dot pi multiplied by radius to the exponent 2. Now we should use our parentheses to make sure this is very clear. Radius to the exponent 2 is equivalent to radius times radius. And well, that is the area of a circle. So now we have a class method inside of this circle class. We have a class attribute. It uses that class attribute. And there we go. OK. All right. So now that we've created this method, let's actually make another method. I'm going to say at class method. And let's go define. And let's call this perimeter. Now, really, we should call this circumference, but perimeter is much easier to spell. So we're going to go with that for right now. I'm going to call this CLS and then radius. OK, so inside of here, I'm going to calculate the perimeter of the circumference of a circle. The way I do that is I return 2 multiplied by CLS.pi multiplied by R, R being radius. OK, so now we have two class methods and we have this one class attribute. Now, you might be looking at this and saying, well, this is kind of silly. 
Why do we have this? Well, the point of this is that now all I have to do if I want to modify pi is I just modify this class attribute. And then both of these class methods here will automatically be updated to use the new version of pi based on whatever level of precision I want. So however many decimals I decide to add here. Both of these class methods do not rely on an instance of this circle class. They work if we have an instance or if we don't have an instance. And the point of me putting them inside of here is that they're both related to a circle. So I'm kind of grouping methods together that make sense to be used together and in the same area. I'm saying, OK, all of the methods related to a circle, I'm going to put in this circle class. That way I can modify, say, one class attribute right here. It will apply to all of them and everything's just very neat, organized, and it's all together. And then if I ever wanted to use any of these methods from another class method, maybe I define a method. Let's do something like uh, at class method, say define get area and perimeter. OK, and then we pass CLS and radius. Maybe what I do is I return CLS dot area and I pass the radius plus CLS dot perimeter and I pass the radius and actually not plus. This would be comma. So now I've used two class methods inside of one class method. That's totally valid. I can do that. So this would be kind of the point of creating this class. So before we end off, let's just look at an example. Let's say circle dot area with a radius of two. So let's print this out and see what we get. And notice we get 12.56. I'm going to assume that's correct. Now let's go with perimeter. We get 12.56. Okay, it's funny how that works. Let's change that to four. I think we'll get something much larger. Okay, 25.12. Uh, and now let's go get area and perimeter of a radius of four. And notice we get 50.24 and 25.12. There you go. That is class methods and class attributes. So with that said, I am going to conclude the video here. Remember, with a class method, you cannot access anything related to the instances. This is just related to the class. Your class attributes, same thing, are only associated with the class. They're not associated with each instance. And that's why something like this works. We don't need to make an instance. We can just directly use the circle class. And in this example, the point of this is to group related methods together and attributes together such that one change will affect all of these. I, I don't have to go and say modify four pi variables or three pi variables or however many methods we have. Anyways, as I was saying, I'm going to conclude the video. I hope you learned something. I look forward to seeing you in another programming expert lesson. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Programming Expert. In this video, I'll be covering static methods. Now, a static method is really a method that sits inside of a class, but that does not have access to the CLS keyword or to the self keyword. So it doesn't act on the class or on an instance of the class. It's really just a function that belongs to the class. Now, similar to class methods, the point of this is to better organize your code and keep related code together. So maybe you have a static method that is a utility function of some sorts that you just keep inside of a specific class because it's highly related to what that class does. Oftentimes you will see classes that actually have no instance methods at all. They don't even have an initialization. Their whole objective is to contain a bunch of static methods. And this just again helps you better organize your code. So maybe you create something like a math class and inside of this math class, you have a bunch of mathematical functions that are really just static methods. That's kind of the point of static methods. Anyways, with that said, let's get into an example here and I'll show you what a static method is. So let's start by looking at the syntax and then we can go into an advanced example. So for now, what I'm going to do is say class student and inside of here, I am going to say define underscore underscore init and then underscore underscore self. And then we'll take a name and we'll take some grades. Now, a grade is just going to be a list of numbers or sorry, grades is going to be a list of numbers representing the different grades that this student had in whatever courses there. We don't really care what they are for right now. I just want to get a list of numbers. OK, so I'm going to say self dot name is equal to name and then self dot grades is equal to grades. Now, notice I made this optional. It's an optional parameter in case they don't have any grades then we'll just have an empty list. OK, perfect. So now we have a student class and what I'm going to do is create a few students. So I'm going to say let's go with S1 is equal to student. We can go with Tim and we can go with, let's say, maybe 80, 75, 65 and 100. Those will be my grades. Now let's make another student. 
let's call this one s2 and we will call this one clement and here we can do 60 and 50 and 65 and 60 clement is not the best student all right so continuing what we're going to do now is create a static method now what i want this static method to do is simply calculate the average of all of the grades for a student so let's write this method the way we create a static method is we use the at static method decorator. So just like at class method, except now it's static method. And then we write the name of the method. So I'm going to say get average from grades. OK, or actually we could change this to just be average from grades. And then what we're going to take inside of here is simply grades. Now, notice I didn't write self as the first parameter. I didn't write CLS as the first parameter. And in fact, nothing is going to be passed this method automatically as the first parameter. This is something that we will have to pass. So this is going to take one parameter. So we have one argument that we will need to pass every time we call this function or this method, whatever you want to call. All right. So inside of here, all I'm going to do is say return the sum of grades divided by the len of grades and that will give us the average all right so now that we've done this let's see how we would call this static method now it turns out we actually call this the exact same way we call our class method so we can either call it on an instance of the student or we can call it directly on the class so i can do something like let's say average is equal to s1 dot average from grades and then what i need to actually pass is the grades of a student. So this doesn't have access to my students grades. It's not an instance attribute. And so I'll pass s one dot grades. And now if I go here and I print out the average, let's see what we get. Notice we get 80. So that was the average for Tim. Now let's do it with Clement. Notice I'm going to call s one dot average from grades and I'm going to pass s two dot grades. This doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I call it on s one or if I call it on s two or if I call it directly on the student class itself, it will work the exact same way. So notice the average here was 58.75. All right, so that is a static method. Again, the best way to think of these is really just like a function that sits inside of a class. It has no access to any of the instance attributes or to the class attributes. You simply use it like a function. Now you might be wondering, well, what is the point of this? Why wouldn't I just change this to an instance method and then make it so that I can just get access to the grades using self dot grades? So why don't I remove the fact that this is a static method and just do this? Well, that'd be fine. You could do this and that's a valid argument. And then you could simply remove grades like this. However, the reason I've set up this static method is because I might want to use it not on an instance of this class or I might want to modify the grade slightly before I use this method. So maybe I only want to look at the first two grades in this list. Well, in this case, I can use this static method to do this, whereas previously, if I set this up as an instance method, I wouldn't be able to run something like this because it would just look at all of the grades inside of the student. And I would need to actually change the grades list to be able to have this give me a different average. So it kind of just gives us some flexibility here. There's arguments for why you would use both. But I just wanted to show you that this is kind of maybe a reason why you would have a static method because you do really want it to act like a function. And yes, it's highly related to the student class, but you don't want to directly be accessing the attributes from each student. And then what I could even do here is do something like S2 grades plus S1 grades. And maybe now I'm trying to look at the average of all of the grades across all of the students. So if I do that, then I get 69.375. So it just gives us some flexibility and allows us to use this as a function rather than an instance method. All right, so hopefully all of this is making sense. What I want to do quickly now is cover something known as static attributes. Now, static attributes are really just the same thing as class attributes. So previously we could we saw we could do something like gravity equals negative 9.8 or maybe we had like num of students equals zero or something like that. Whatever we looked at this in a previous lesson and we call these class attributes. Now this is kind of their correct name, but they also are referred to as static attributes as well. So if you hear people refer to a static attribute specifically in Python, just understand that's the same thing as a class attribute. Just wanted to cover that in case you come across it. Static and class attributes are really the same in Python. All right, so now that we have that, I'm going to do a quick recap of our static method versus our instance method versus our class method. Just to make sure everyone is very clear on how these work. 
All right, so let's create a class method here. Let's say at class method and let's say define and we will again do average from grades plus bump is what I'm going to call this. Now, what this class method is going to do is it's going to calculate the average of all of the grades that we pass to it, but it is going to bump them by a specific amount. So you've probably had this happen before. You've probably seen this before in high school or university or anywhere where you have some grading system. Oftentimes, if the class performed poorly, they will bump everyone's grade by a certain amount. It will usually be based on kind of a curve. So if you have a higher grade, you get bumped less. However, in this case, I'm just going to bump everyone's grade or everyone's average of all of their grades by a set amount. And that amount is going to be stored in a class attribute. So I'm going to say grade underscore bump is equal to 2.0. So this is a class attribute or a static attribute. And now from inside of here, I can access this. So I'm going to say CLS as my first parameter. I'm going to take in a list of grades. And what I'm going to do is actually use this static method in the class to calculate the average of the grades. And then I'm going to bump them by this grade bump attribute. So I'm going to say average is equal to CLS dot average, not like that, average from underscore grades. We're going to pass the grades to that. And then I'm going to return the average plus 2.0. However, I want to make sure that no person has an average that is above 100. So how would I do that? Well, I could implement an if statement and I could say if the average plus two is above 100, then just return 100. But I also can use the max function. So I can say the max of average plus two and 100. And sorry, actually, this should be the min function, not the max function. So what this will do is take the minimum of 100 and whatever this is. So if this is above 100, then we will just give 100. Whereas if this is something like 99, then we will return 99. So this is just kind of a clever way that we can solve that problem. Anyways, this is a class method. So notice we have the at class method decorator. Notice we take CLS as this first parameter, and then we can use something like a static method from inside of this class class method. That's totally fine. OK, and then this is the static method. So we have add static method. We don't take any mandatory first parameter. So we could have a static method that actually takes no parameters at all. And well, this is the class versus the static method. Now let's look at an instance method. So we're going to implement the same thing here, except now we're going to do it on the instance. So I'm going to say define average self. We don't need to take any other parameters. And what we can do is return and we can either decide to use one of these class or static methods or just implement the uh, the average ourselves. So I'll say the sum of self dot grades over the sum or sorry, not the sum, the len of self dot grades. All right, so there we go. We now have an instance method. So notice how this differs from the class method and the static method. We have no decorator over top of it. We take self as the first mandatory parameter, and then we can access the grades directly from here, right? So we can just say self.grades and get access to the instances grades and use that to return the average. All right, so with that said, that pretty much covers everything I need to go over in this video. Now, I will quickly mention that the main difference between the static method and the class method is that the class method has access to things related to the class. So class attributes and other class methods and static methods that are a part of the class. That's why from inside here, we could use this static method because we have access to the class. Now, theoretically, inside of the static method, we can still access the class attributes and we can still access the other class methods or other static methods. We could do something like student dot and then grade bump, right? And we could change this if we wanted to. However, this is not good practice because inside of the static method, this is supposed to act just like a function. So it's not supposed to rely on anything from outside of the function. So it shouldn't be relying on something like a class attribute or something like other class methods. Instead, it should just work independently of everything else. And that's why we call it a static method. So yes, even though you can do this, you should not do that. It's considered bad practice. If you find inside of your static method that you need to access the class attributes or other class methods, then instead you should change this to a class method and get access to this CLS keyword and then use that instead of the class name directly to access other methods or other attributes. So I was just about to end the video here, but I realized when we were doing this recap that I made a very small mistake actually a few minutes ago in the video, and I just want to fix it now. 
So inside of this class method, many of you may have noticed that I accidentally hard coded this 2.0 rather than using the grade bump attribute. So this is not necessarily wrong. Me adding 2.0 to the average is the same as me doing something like CLS dot grade bump. However, it is worse practice for me to be manually hard coding in that 2.0 because that means if I ever decide to change the grade bump attribute here, it's not going to be reflected in this method. So just make sure you make that change here from 2.0 to CLS dot grade bump. Again, it's just best practice to be using the grade bump attribute. So that way, if we ever decide to change that, it will automatically be adjusted inside of this method. Anyways, that was the mistake. I'm sure many of you caught on to that before. So my apologies. But with that said, I will end the video here. So I hope you found this helpful. and I look forward to seeing you in another programming expert lesson. Hello, everybody, and welcome to programming expert. In this video, I'll be covering inheritance. Now, inheritance is another very important object oriented programming concept. And what inheritance states is that one class can actually inherit the functionality of another class. Now, before I get into that, I just want to quickly mention that if you are familiar with inheritance, if you've seen this concept before, please do still watch this video because there's a lot of specific details in Python that are different related to inheritance than in other programming languages that are object oriented. So just make sure you're aware that Python uses and works with inheritance a little bit differently than other languages. OK, so continuing, let's talk more about inheritance. As I was saying, what inheritance does is it allows you to have one class inherit or use the functionality from another class. Now, the reason this is important is because oftentimes you have a bunch of related classes in your program. For example, maybe we have a manager class, an employee class, maybe we have an owner class, maybe we have a person class. All of these classes are related in some way. In fact, a manager is an employee and an employee is a person and an owner is also a person, right? All of these classes kind of share some functionality with each other. Let's say that every single person in our program, so regardless if they're an owner, manager, empl employee, whatever it may be, they all have a first name and a last name. Well, do I want to duplicate defining a first name and a last name in every single one of their classes? Or do I want to have some functionality that's common to all of the classes that's stored in one place? Well, the latter is what I'd prefer because that then means if I need to make any change to this functionality in the future, I change it in one place and it will apply to all of the classes. I'm sure this is a little bit vague and confusing right now, but the whole idea is that inheritance allows you to have related classes reuse functionality such that it's easier to debug in the future, easier to modify or change, and allows you to not have to duplicate code throughout your program, which is something that you just shouldn't do. All right, so now that we've talked about that, I need to quickly describe a term known as polymorphism. Now, polymorphism actually originates from biology, and the term poly means many, and morphism means forms. So if we have polymorphism, this stands for many forms or multiple forms. Now, in the context of object-oriented programming, what this says is that we can treat objects differently based on the context that we're using them in. And a single object may have multiple characteristics, but exhibit different behavior based on how we're treating it in our program. So if we go back to the example where we have a manager, we have an employee and we have a person, we know that if you are a manager, you are also an employee. And if you're an employee, you are also a person. Now, this means if I create an instance of the manager class, I can treat this object like a manager or I can treat it just like a normal employee. It doesn't matter that this object is also a manager. I can still use all of the behavior that employees have on this manager because it is an employee. Same thing with person. I can treat all of my employees just like normal people because every single employee is a person. Now, we're going to see examples of this as we go through this video. But for now, just understand that polymorphism is multiple forms or many forms. And really what it allows us to do is treat our objects differently and have them have different behavior based on the situation or the context that we use them in. Anyways, let's continue and get into an example. So let's actually kind of implement that example I discussed before. I'm going to say class and we'll start with our person class. And we'll say that every single person has a first name. So we'll go self and then we'll go first name and last name. OK, so we're going to say self dot first name equals first name and self dot last name is equal to last name. OK, this is the initialization of our person class and every single person, let's say, has a method that allows them to say hello. So let's say print say underscore hello. This will take self and this will print out. Hi, my name is 
and then we'll say self dot first name space and then self dot last name. Okay. So there we go. That's our say hello method. Now what I want to do is create my employee class. So let's say I want this employee class to have all of the same functionality as my person class, because again, every single employee is a person. And so theoretically, all of the stuff inside of here should apply inside of here. Well, what I could do is copy it all and just paste it inside of here. Now I have an employee class, I have a person class. They're the exact same. That's fine. But then maybe inside of this employee class, I go and I add another method. I can say something like maybe test. We'll just go with a super simple example right now. And maybe all this method does is just print out test. Okay. So this is the special change I want in my employee class. So now these classes are almost the exact same. The only difference is this class implements a method that this class doesn't have access to. So again, this is really bad. I, I shouldn't do this. There's no reason why I actually need to rewrite all of this code, especially if an employee is a person. Instead, what I can use is inheritance. So let me delete all of this and show you how I can make the employee class inherit and use all of the functionality from the person class. Well, to do this is very straightforward. We put two parentheses and inside of here we put person. So what we can actually do here is list all of the classes. And yes, I said all you can actually have multiple inheritance in Python that you want this class here to inherit from. Now, I just need to go through a little bit of terminology here because I'll likely use it in the next few minutes. When we do this, this is known as our child class, our derived class or our subclass. OK, the class that inherits from something is the child class, the subclass or the derived class. Whereas this class here, the class we're inheriting from is known as the super class, the base class or the parent class. So pretty intuitive naming. But the idea is that this is the child of this, because in this inheritance hierarchy, this is above this, right? We define this first and then this inherits from this. And so the employee is the child. It is the derived class or it is the subclass. And the person class is our base class, our super class or our parent class. Perfect. Now, employee has access to everything inside of its super class. And I'll just prove this to you. Let's make a new employee. Let's say E equals employee. And let's initialize this, say Tim. And I'll make the last name programmer. OK, when I run this, notice we don't get an error. Everything is totally fine. And the reason for that is we are using this initialization inside of the employee class because I did not define initialization inside of employee. We decided just to use the one that was inside of person again because we inherit from person. So everything inside of person you can use inside of employee. Another example of this, I can do something like E dot say hello. And if I run this, notice we get hi, my name is Tim program works totally fine. Now let's change the example and let's make this a person. So rather than E equals employee, let's make a person. And when I run this, we get the exact same thing, right? Works totally fine. However, I cannot call E dot test, which is a method that is defined inside of employee not inside a person because person does not inherit from employee employee inherits from person. And so this does not have access to what's inside of employee. It's only one way. This is a one directional relationship. Employee is inheriting from person. Person does not get access to the stuff inside of employee. Employee just gets access to the stuff inside of person. So let's change this back now and make this employee. And notice that now the test method works. That's totally fine. We use it inside of here. All right. So now that we understand that, Let's talk about how we can actually override methods that exist inside of our super or inside of our base class. So a lot of times we have a base class that has a ton of stuff inside of it. Maybe we have hundreds of methods, a ton of functionality. There's a lot of stuff in here. And the reason we're inheriting from it is because we want almost all of it, almost all of the stuff in there we want. We want to be able to use it and we don't want to have to rewrite all of it. However, the issue is sometimes there's stuff in here that we don't want or that we want to change the way that it works. So maybe we have this say hello function here, say hello method, and we want it to work a little bit differently inside of the person class. Maybe we want it to do this, but we also want it to print something else out, right? Well, the way that we would kind of fix this issue is we would override the method inside of the child class or the derived class. So I can do something like define say hello. And what I've just done is I've overridden the parent class. Okay. So what was here is now changed. 
for the employee class. And if, when you call, say hello, we're going to use the method defined here, not the one inside of the person class. But remember, I said, maybe we want to do exactly what happens here, but we just want to change it a little bit. We just want to print something before or after. Maybe actually we just want to do something super simple. Like we want to print a bunch of lines, then whatever they printed, we want to print it in between the two sets of lines. That's all we want to do. Well, if that's the case, I could manually just copy this and paste it here. That's fine. This would work. But again, I don't want to be repeating code if I don't have to. And then if I change the way that say hello works here, I got to change it here as well. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this keyword called super. Now, super is something that you can access by calling it like this. And what it does is it gives you access to the parent class. So I can actually say super and then dot say underscore hello like this. And when I do this, what will happen is implicitly, which means we don't see it kind of invisibly, we will pass this self keyword to the say hello method that's on our super class. So I say super like this dot say hello and just watch what happens now on my employee class when I do say hello. Notice we get our lines, we get hi, my name is Tim the programmer, and then we get the lines after. Okay. So if you want to actually access methods from the parent class or from the super class, you use super with two parentheses, don't forget the parentheses, and then dot say hello. And that will actually call this method on this instance, the instance that we call this method on. And so that's kind of how that works. Understand it's a little bit complicated, but this is how we override a method. And we don't have to call super, right? I could just print the lines like this. And now we're just going to print the lines when we call say hello on employee. But on person, we're still going to use this method. So if we say something like P equals person and we go with Joe and let's just go with blank for the last name and we go P dot say hello. We're still going to use this method for our person because this only overrides when we use it on an object that is of type employee. OK, so that's the very basics of inheritance. Now what I need to show you, though, is how we override a constructor. So a lot of times what happens is we want to use, again, a lot of the functionality from this base class or from this parent class, but we want to change it a little bit. So we do want all of our employees to have a first name and a last name, but maybe we want them to have a department or a salary or something like that. Well, if that's the case and we want to initialize them with that, we need to override this constructor. We need to change the constructor slightly. So how do we do that without repeating everything that we have here? Well, we actually need to repeat the definition of the constructor. So we're going to say define init like this, and then we need self first name, last name, and then any other attributes that we require to initialize this employee. So I'm going to say something like salary. So now what I can do is I can use the constructor from here by calling the soup. So I can say super dot underscore underscore init first name, last name. And then what I will do is I will manually define the salary attribute myself. I'll say self dot salary equals salary. Now, it seems a little bit redundant what I've just done here, but this is actually what's required when you override the constructor or the initialization from a parent or super class. So since our parent or our super class took a first name and a last name, we must at minimum require that in the employee class. Now, we could actually not take that as parameters, but we would still need to pass a first name and a last name. I guess we would just have to make up those names then to the parent constructor. So. I'm putting first name and last name because, well, I want the first name and the last name for my employee. And then I'm also taking a salary. So what I'm doing is I'm saying super dot underscore underscore net. I'm manually calling this initialization. You can do this. You can manually call the initialization. And notice how I'm not passing self as the first argument. Again, the reason I'm not doing that is because this will implicitly, so kind of invisibly, pass self for me. So I say super dot init. I pass first name and last name. And then what will happen is this initialization will run. So for this instance, whatever we're trying to initialize, it will create a first name and a last name attribute and set it equal to this. Then after that runs, I will manually declare my own attribute. I will say self dot salary equals salary. So now my employees have a salary as well as a first name and a last name. Now, some of you may be asking me, well, Tim, why do I need to do this? Why can't I just write this? Why can't I write self dot first name, self dot last name like that? Why can't I just write that? Well. You can do this, but the issue is that in Python, you actually mandatorily need to call this. Whenever you override the constructor of your super class, you need to manually call the constructor because sometimes inside of this constructor, it's doing things that you don't actually know about. 
Okay, so in this case, it's very simple because we're just declaring two attributes, but sometimes we're going to do a bunch of other very, very complicated stuff inside of this initialization. So if you don't call the initialization of the parent class, it's possible that all of the attributes and methods inside of the parent class will no longer operate properly. For example, if we had maybe a Boolean attribute here, so if we did something like self dot, I don't know, let's go with locked equals true. And then maybe inside of one of these methods, I use this locked attribute. Well, if I didn't manually call this initialization here, then I wouldn't have access to the locked attribute and some of these methods would fail in the future. So Python actually mandates that you do call this initialization. So you manually call it on the parent class if you override the parent constructor. I know this is a little bit weird and confusing, but just try to remember that you need to do this if you do decide to override the constructor. And we will have a practice question here on Programming Expert on doing this so you can get some practice and uh, mess around with it yourself. Regardless, let's run this now and let's just work with employee. So let's say equals employee Tim Programmer. Let's pass a salary of 50,000 and let's run say hello. Notice everything works. Now what I'm going to do is inside of say hello, I am just going to actually call super dot say hello. And then I'm going to print my salary is and then we'll put an F string here and we'll say self dot salary. OK, so now when I run this, we say, hi, my name is Tim Programmer. My salary is 50,000. Perfect. So that is the basics of inheritance. That's how you override the constructor. And then I showed you already how you override methods. Now what I need to talk to you about is multiple inheritance and larger inheritance hierarchy. So we'll actually do other inheritance or larger inheritance hierarchies first, and then we'll look at multiple inheritance. So remember, the example I originally brought up had to do with a manager and an owner as well. So those are other classes that we need to define. Now, every manager and every owner is a person, but every manager is an employee. Every owner is not, right? So what I need to do is define two more classes. I say class manager. And this is going to inherit from employee. So notice how now this manager class is inheriting from employee and employee is inheriting from person. What that actually means is that any instance of my manager is an employee and is a person, just like every instance of my employee class is also a person as well as an employee. OK, I'll show you and I'll prove that to you in a minute, but I just want to kind of state that. This goes back to polymorphism that I talked about before. When you have the inheritance hierarchy like this, if you make an instance of manager, anything it inherits from this object is technically an instance of that class as well, because it has all of that functionality right on the parent class. Anyways, let's make our manager class and all I'll do inside of manager is I'll override the constructor and I'll add one more attribute, which will make department. OK, so we'll say self first name, last name, salary and then department. So now we'll pass salary and instead of saying self that salary, we'll say self that department is equal to department. So what we've done is we've overridden the constructor of the employee class. So we've redefined it here. We've taken first name, last name, salary and department. We've then used this constructor to initialize first name, last name and salary. And we've then defined our new attribute, which is department. OK, that's it. That's our manager class. So now let's change E to manager. And actually, we can just make this M just to make sure it's clear. And we'll say Tim programmer 50,000 and department. I don't know. We can just put sports. OK, so when I run this, we get the exact same thing. We're still able to use this say hello method right here. And notice that we're using this say hello method. We're not using this say hello method. So this is kind of how the hierarchy works. And this is why I wanted to show you this example. The employee class inherits from the person class and the manager class inherits from the employee class. So in this instance, the manager class is the child class or the base class, and the employee class is the super class, the parent class or the base class. But then you go to employee and in this context, employee is the subclass, right? It is the derived class or it is the child class because it is inheriting from person, which is its super class. So this is all relative relative to manager. Employee is a super class, but relative to person employee is a subclass, right? So it all depends in which context you're looking at it from. And that means when we here in manager call super, we're calling this on employee. We're not calling it on person. We're calling it on employee. And then employee does whatever it does. And if it inherits from person, great, that's fine. But in our case, we don't care. We're just using employee as our super class. Hopefully that makes sense. But that's why this method is running and not this method. 
when we call m.say hello. Perfect. Okay, so now we've done manager. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to implement owner. So let's say class owner. Now, owner is not an employee, but owner is a person. So let's say owner, person, and then again, we'll just override the initialization. So let me actually just copy the employee's initialization. And rather than a salary, uh, as the last argument here, as the last parameter here, what should we have for owner? Uh, maybe we'll go with something like net worth, okay? Just for example purposes. So now instead of self.salary, we're going to say self.networth and self dot net worth. Okay, perfect. So now we're inheriting from person. If we call the say hello method now on owner, what method is going to run? Question for you, if I call say hello on an instance of owner, what is going to happen? Well, we're going to run the method here that's inside of person, right? We're going to run say hello because we inherit from person. So in this context, person is the base class. It is the super class. It is the parent class whereas owner is the derived class, the subclass, or the child class. Now let's make an instance of owner. So we'll just say O equals owner. We'll pass a net worth of 50,000. That's fine. And sorry, not zero. This is meant to be O. And let's say O dot say hello. Run this and notice. Oh, type error. Uh, we have an issue here. Ah, so the problem that occurred here was I forgot to rename this class to owner. I'm sure many of you probably saw that. So anyways, we'll just change this to owner. And now when I run this and unfortunately we get another error, it says owner object has no attribute net worth. Okay. That's because I have the self here. So let's remove that. So we're referencing the parameter dot something that doesn't exist yet. Okay. Let's run this and notice we get, my name is Tim program. So we're calling this method right here. Okay, so now we have a bunch of classes that are inheriting from each other and it's starting to get a little bit complicated. So what I want to talk about is what type each one of our instances are. This is actually an interesting question. It seems obvious, but it is a little bit more complicated than this. So if I print out the type of O, what am I going to get? Go ahead and take a guess. When I run this, notice we get main.owner. So this O instance here, is an instance of the owner class. However, it's also an instance of the person class. So even though it's type, it's technical type is owner, it still is of type person. And the way that we can check that is we can use a new method I'm going to introduce to our new function, sorry, called is instance. Okay. Is instance allows us to check if a specific object is a type. Okay. So I'm going to say O and comma. And then I'm going to put person like this. So I'm checking if O is an instance of a class person. So what are we going to get? Well, when I run this, notice we get true. And the reason it's an instance of class person is because owner inherits from person. And so by that definition, that means that our owner right here must be a person. All right. So now that we've looked at that, this leads me to the is a rule. Is a is like this. Okay. Is a. Now the is a rule. It's just a theoretical rule. This isn't some syntax or anything I'm going to show you in Python. But what it states is that if owner inherits from person, owner is a person. And if owner is not a person, then this is an incorrect inheritance. Owner is a person when I do it like this. Okay. If owner inherits from person, it is a person. If it is not a person, this inheritance has to go. So whenever you do inheritance here, you have to make sure that whatever class you have is whatever the super class or the parent class is. So in this case, a manager is a employee. And so this is a valid inheritance. But if I tried to say manager owner, so is a manager an owner, that's not necessarily true. For some cases that might be true, but it needs to be for every single case. Every single owner would need to be a manager or every single manager would need to be an owner for the is our rule to be satisfied. So let's just write it in so that it's clear. This is an invalid inheritance because if I can find any example where a manager is not an owner, then this is not good. Okay. That's the is our rule. So that's kind of how you can decide if you're going to use an inheritance or not. Is the class that I'm defining that's going to be a subclass the superclass? Is it that? Is every single instance going to be an instance of or is going to be whatever the superclass or base class is? Okay. So continuing, let's now look at the is instance on a few other classes. So we see this manager class, manager inherits from employee, and employee inherits from person. So is our manager also a person? 
another question here. So let's change this to M. And let's see if manager, first of all, I need to also pass a department. So let's go here with sports. Is a manager a person? Go ahead, pause the video if you need to. I'm gonna run it now. Yes, it is, okay? So a manager is a person, and the reason the manager is a person is because a manager is an employee, an employee is a person. Therefore, manager is a person. So is a manager an employee? Well, I kind of just answered the question, but yes, it is. A manager is an employee. And lastly, is a manager a manager? Well, yes, a manager is a manager. And is a manager an owner? Well, no, a manager is not an owner, right? Even though an owner is also a person, that does not make a manager an owner. Perfect. Okay, so now that we have looked at that, let's make a person. So let's say P equals person. And I just want to continue with this exercise to make sure it's very clear. So let's now check if a person is an owner. Go ahead and take a guess. But we see the owner inherits from person. So is person an owner? Well, it is not, okay? Again, this only goes in one direction. When I do owner inherits from person, that does not mean that person inherits from owner. And so a person is a non-owner, although an owner can be a person. It goes in one direction. Okay, so now that we understand that, I need to move on and talk about multiple inheritance. Now, this is where it starts to get a little bit confusing and complicated and where things that you know about object-oriented programming and other programming languages may no longer apply here in Python. Now, you don't have to worry about this too much. If this is over your head, not a big deal. Multiple inheritance is something you don't use too often. It is relatively rare, but it is a nice feature to have in Python if you know how to use it properly. So let's actually clear all of this and let's just do a very simple example using some classes that don't actually have any meaning. So we're going to say class A, okay, class B, and class C. So we have class A, class B, and class C. This is what we'll use for our example. And I want class B to inherit from class A. And then I actually, you know what? I'm going to change this. I don't want class B to inherit from class A. I want class C to inherit from both class A and class B. So in this case right now, you have to ask yourself, which one is the parent class? Is A the parent class? Is B the parent class? What is the parent class of this class? Well, the answer is both of them are actually parent classes to class C. So when we're talking about class C, this is the subclass, this is the derived class, or this is the child class. And class A and B are both parent classes, both base classes, or both super classes of class C. However, it gets a bit complicated because if I go inside of here and I define an init now, I say self name, let's say self.name equals name, and let's just print. You know what? We actually don't need to take any arguments. We can even make this simpler. Let's just print A. And then let's do the exact same thing inside of B. So let's go print out B. And then let's make an instance of C. So let's say... Uh, C is equal to C. What's going to print out? That's my question to you. This is not something that you should know the answer to, but what's going to print out right now if I make an instance of C? We're going to use one of these initialization methods, but is it going to be A or is it going to be B? Because we inherit from both of them. So what is the true superclass? Which one are we actually going to use? Well, let's run this and notice that we use A. So whatever is defined first is actually where we're going to go to look for methods first. So when I run this, when I run C, I initialize C, I'm saying, okay, I want to create an instance of class C. Now, what we do when we create an instance is we look for this init method. So we start by looking in C and we say, does C have this init method? It does not have this init method. And so then what we do is we go through these classes in order, in the order in which they're defined, looking for this method. So we go to A and we say, does class A have an init method? Well, yes, it does. So we're going to go ahead and use this method. And so since class A had this method, we're done. We just run the method. But if class A did not have this method, then we would run B, right? So now if I do this, notice we get B because we looked in C, we didn't have it. We looked at A, we didn't have it. We looked in B, we had it. So we ran it, okay? Whatever one we encounter first is the one that we run. So of course, if I define my own init here, as we already know, this one will run. So let's say self, but now... Let's get even more complicated. What happens if I do this? What runs now? What does super reference? Does it reference A or does it reference B? Now you might be able to guess, but let's run this. Notice we get A. So this super keyword is going to reference A, but if A does not have the method we're looking for, then it's going to reference B. <laughs> so if I remove this now and I go like that, 
and I run this, notice that we get B. So we start by looking at A, and if A doesn't have it, we look in B. And so super really is referencing all of our super classes, all of the classes that we inherit from, but we just start looking at the one that was defined first, and then the one that was defined second after. Now, this is what's known as the MRE, or the MRO, sorry, the method resolution order of methods in classes. Now, this only applies in Python with multiple inheritance because typically you can't do this. In a lot of programming languages, you cannot have multiple inheritance. And why this is complicated is because you have to have a set way of knowing which super class we should actually be looking in. And you can imagine this gets even more complicated when these classes are also inheriting from multiple other classes. When you have layers of multiple inheritance, it gets very, very complicated very fast. However, this is known as the method resolution order. We start by looking in the main class. If it is not in the main class, we look in the first super class. If it's not in the first super class, we look in the second super class. That is the way that we resolve calling different methods on classes that implement multiple inheritance. All right, so now that we've looked at this, I just want to quickly mention that multiple inheritance is really complicated. I've said that a bunch of times, so please do not feel stressed if you don't understand what I've just gone through right now. This is not something that you're going to need to be a master at, and in a lot of cases, you never need to use multiple inheritance. If you do, this is the basics. This is how it works. There will be a few questions on it, but again, not super important, so don't focus on it too heavily. That said, though, there is the same is out rule that applies when you do multiple inheritance. So if C is not an instance of A or C is not an instance of B or C is not A or C is not B, whatever you want to say, then you can't do this. This is invalid. So in this case, C is A and C is B. So if I check if C is an instance of A, that will be true. If I check if C is an instance of B, that will be true as well. So let's just do a quick check. Say is instance and let's go C B. Uh, this should be is instance. So not instance like that. Notice that we get true. And if I check if it's an instance of A, this is true as well. So just wanted to show that to you before we move on to the next topic. All right. So now what I'm going to do is clear all of this. We're going to get into a better example of inheritance. And I'm going to talk to you about something known as duck typing. Now, duck typing is kind of a weird term, something you probably haven't heard before related to programming. But this is something specific in Python and in a few other programming languages as well that is really, really useful. And it has to relate to inheritance and to polymorphism. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to copy an example I've pre-written in here to illustrate to you duck typing. Now, the fact that I named this class duck does not have anything to do with duck typing, but I just figured it'd be good for this example because we're explaining duck typing. Anyways, we have two classes, duck class, whale class. Have a read through them. We have an animals list. We create two ducks, one whale. We loop through all the animals. And then what do we do? Well, we print out animal.swim and animal.fly, or we call animal.swim and call animal.fly. So pause the video if you need to. I'm just going to run the code, but take a guess at what you think the output's going to be. So when I run this, we get swimming duck, flying duck, swimming duck, flying duck, swimming whale. Then we crash. And the reason why we crash is because the whale object has no attribute fly. Really, it has no method fly. And so when we try to run dot fly on our whale, the last item in the list here, the program crashes. Now, the reason why I'm even showing this to you, because it seems very obvious, seems very intuitive, is because in a lot of other programming languages, you can't do this. You can't even run this code. Notice I ran the code. Everything worked fine until it crashed. So Python didn't tell me this was invalid before the code was running. It was only when I got to this stage in time, it said, hey, that's no good. This has to do with some internals and behind the scenes stuff in Python. But in a lot of other programming languages, this code won't actually run. You won't even be allowed to execute this code because during what's known as the compilation stage of the program, when the code's kind of being read and turned into machine code that can be interpreted by the computer, what occurs is it looks at the type of all of the different objects and how they're being used in the program, and it won't even allow you to use a method on an object that's not a specific type. So even if that object has the method defined, if it's not the correct type, it won't even let you run the code. Now, I'm sure this is very, very confusing right now, especially because we haven't worked in that language yet. But the point is that here I'm running animal.swim and animal.fly. Now I have two different types here. I have my duck and I have my whale. My whale does not have a fly method on it. And so what would actually happen in another programming language, a language like Java, for example, is I would get an error before I ran my code that said, hey, this is not valid. I do not know that I can run this method because this whale, it doesn't have the fly method defined. This is a very oversimplification of what occurs, but it would just not even let me run the code. But in Python, this is different. Python doesn't care. 
it says, okay, well, this method might not work, but that doesn't matter to me. I'm just going to try it anyways. So in Python, what occurs is when you try to use a method or an attribute or something on an object, it doesn't check beforehand if this exists, it just tries it. And this is where the concept of duck typing comes in. Duck typing is kind of this notion of if something acts like a duck, so if something walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it must be a duck. And so Python doesn't care that this is not the correct type, that whale is not the correct type that has fly method on it. It's like, okay, I'll just try it anyways. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. That's kind of what I mean by duck type. Again, I'm sure this is a little bit confusing, but this is just something that you can do in Python that you can't do in other programming languages. So I wanted to highlight it here. And I'm sure as you gain more experience with object oriented programming and maybe look at other languages, you'll appreciate this even more. For now, just understand that in Python, the type of the object does not necessarily define what you can and can't try to do with the object. If something doesn't work, well, you'll get an error, right? An error will occur. But in other programming languages, it actually limits your ability to even attempt it. Whereas in Python, it just tries it. And again, the duck typing, if it acts like a duck, so if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it must be a duck. It doesn't care. Okay. So that is pretty much all I need to cover in this video. There was a lot of stuff that happened here. The next few lessons, however, will continue to build on inheritance and add some new concepts. And so you'll get lots of practice with this and hopefully it will be crystal clear by the end of this section. With that said, I am going to conclude the video. I hope you learned something and I look forward to seeing you in another programming expert lesson. Hello, everybody, and welcome to programming expert. In this video, I'll be covering abstract classes. Now, an abstract class is just a class that never has any instances of it. So it's a class that should not be instantiated and a class that is meant to act as a base class, a super class or a parent class to other classes in the program. Its objective is solely to increase the abstraction of the program. I'll discuss what that means in a second and to contain common implementation details to other classes. So similar to what we had previously with inheritance, we had the person class. Now, the person class is something that we did create an instance of, but its point in the program was to contain stuff that's going to be common to anything that is a person. So to the manager class, the employee class, to the owner class, that was really the main role of that person class. Now, we didn't call that an abstract class because, again, we could have an instance of it. That's fine. We can represent something using that class. But in this case, we're going to create classes that will never have any instances of them. And that is why it's called an abstract class. Now, an abstract class can implement methods, right? It can have a static method, a class method, an instance method. That is fine. It also can have what's known as an abstract method. Now, an abstract method is a method that is not yet implemented by this class, but that is required to be implemented by any class that inherits from it. I understand this is a lot to take in at once, but I just want to give you the general overview. Now let's get into an example. Now, theoretically, Python does not have the notion of an abstract class. We can't actually make something abstract. We can't force it to never be able to be instantiated. At least we can't do that in a very easy way. And so the class I'm going to show you here is not really an abstract class, just like the private method or the private uh, attribute story is not really a private attribute. This is something that is just by convention, we're not going to create an instance of. And so we're calling it abstract class. In other programming languages, there is actually an abstract keyword. So you can actually write abstract like that. And this will create an abstract class and it doesn't let you make an instance of it. But again, here in Python, by convention, if something is kind of denoted as an abstract class, we're just going to treat it like it is an abstract class and not make any instances of it. Anyways, let's make an abstract class. For this class, what I want to do is make a game class. I'm going to say class game like this, and I'm going to call it abstract like this game. Now, typically you wouldn't call the class abstract something, but since in Python we don't have this notion of abstract classes, we uh, denote a abstract prefix to the class to make sure that everyone knows this is an abstract class. Do not make instances of it. Perfect. Okay, so what we're going to do inside of here is define any behavior that's going to be common to something that is a game. So when you design these abstract classes, you want to make them as abstract as possible, as general as possible. That's kind of another word you can use for abstract. And this is because anything that is a game could inherit from abstract game. So what is a game? Well, we have to pick what we want to represent a game as and what methods we want a game to have. But let's start doing some very basic implementation. 
So let's just define a method that all games can use. And this method will be called start. So I'm going to say define uh, start like this. This will just take in self. And then what we will do inside of here is we will say uh, start equals input. And we will say, would you like to play question mark? And actually, we can just keep asking this until the user tells us that they would like to play. So we'll say, well, true. We'll say start is equal to would you like to play? And then as soon as the user inputs, so if start is equal to yes, and we'll turn this into a dot lower, then we will start. So then we will say colon break like this. OK, this is our start method. This is an instance method. Theoretically, we could make this a static method or we could make this a class method. And in fact, we actually probably should do that because this method does not access any of the attributes on our instance. And so this would be better off being a static method. So instead of having this be an instance method, we're going to make it a static method. So we'll say at static method like that. OK, so we have our start method. This is common to all games. Now, in the same way that we have start, Let's have another method and let's call this end. Now, what I want to do inside of this end method is this again will be a static method. And all this will do is print out the game has ended. OK, we're going to add to this, but for now, we'll just leave it like that. OK, so now we have our start and our end. What I want to do, though, is I now want to create what's known as an abstract method. Now, an abstract method is a method that needs to be implemented by any class that inherits from this abstract game class. Now, the point of these abstract methods is that we are going to use these abstract methods inside of this abstract class, but they only work when we have a concrete instance or a concrete implementation of this class or of this method. Now, again, I'm sure a lot of this is confusing, but just follow along for now and you will see what I mean. So we're going to define a few methods and they will be abstract methods. Now, the first method I'm going to make here is going to be called play. OK. So we're going to have this play method. I don't know what this play method is going to do. But we're just going to say define play self. And then inside of here, I am going to raise a not implemented error. OK, so there's an exception in Python called not implemented error. If you raise this, well, you get a not implemented error. And so what's going to occur is if you try to call this method and it has not been implemented, then we get this error. And what I mean by implemented is we want a base class or sorry, not a base class, a child class, a derived class of this abstract game class to implement this method. So anything that inherits from this needs to override this method and provide an implementation for it. So inside of here, I'm going to say uh, you must provide an implementation for play. OK, that's fine. Now I know it's cutting off. Uh, actually, we can make this a bit larger and then you can see it. Great. OK, so we have play. Now, what else do I want? Well, the next method that I want is going to be reset, OK, like that. And then here you must find impl implementation for reset. So now inside of the end method, what I'm actually going to do is after I say the game has ended, I'm going to call the reset method. So I'm going to say uh, in this case, I need to convert this back to an instance method. Self dot reset. So I do want access to self because this reset method will be an instance method. And since that's an instance method, to be able to call the instance method, I need access to the instance. So I have a self. Now, that actually means the start method is also going to have to be an instance method. Again, the reason I need to do that is because if I'm going to access another method, then I need access to either the CLS, the class name, or the instance. And if it's going to be an instance method I want access to, well, I need access to the instance. Now, inside of start, what I'm going to do is if they decide to start the game, I am going to, after the while loop, say, self.play. So we will have start. If they say start, then we'll start playing the game and then end, right? As soon as the game ends, we will reset the game. And those are going to call these two methods right here. So right now, if we tried to use this class, it wouldn't really work. It wouldn't do anything because these two methods are going to raise exceptions. And so that is why we need a class to inherit from this class and then implement these two methods. So let's create a class that is going to do that. Now, I'm just going to pause for one second and continue really trying to clarify what the point of this is, because I understand this is very new and you haven't seen something like this, so it seems strange why we're doing this. The point is that we are providing the start and we are providing the end. So this class is implementing behavior. We have start and we have end. Okay, Those already exist. They are here. However, we need whoever inherits from this to give us play and to give us reset. Now, the point of this is this kind of provides a framework for every game. 
we know we have a start, we have an end, we have a play and we have a reset. Play and reset need to be implemented by the game. That's specific to each game. The way that a game starts is always the same and a way that a game ends is always the same as well. We could override these if we want to, but we don't need to. And so a class inheriting from this already gets start and end and start and end will use these two methods, but the class must implement those two methods. Otherwise, an exception will be raised. That's the point. And so we call this an abstract method because we raise an exception if it's not implemented. So whenever you see raise not implemented error, you can kind of assume this is an abstract method and it's abstract because it's saying, hey, you need to implement a method called play. You need to implement a method called reset abstract. This is general. It's just telling you what to implement. And then we give the concrete implementation in the child class. All right. So now that we've done this, let's actually write a class that is going to inherit from abstract game. And I'll show you how we can override these methods and work with the abstract class. So I'm going to say class. Uh, let's call this random and then maybe guesser like that. And this is going to implement from abstract game. And we're just going to implement a game that we've already done, which is kind of the random number guesser. OK, now, since we're going to be generating a random number, I'll go with import random like that. And now inside of here, I'm going to start by defining an init. So I'm going to say define underscore underscore init self. And then let's go with num games. So this is how many games of this game do you want to play or how many rounds? So maybe we'll go with rounds instead of games. We'll go rounds like that. Uh, and now I'm going to say self dot rounds equal to rounds and self dot round is equal to zero. So we start off at round zero and we go up to this many rounds. OK, now notice I can do whatever I want here, right? I'm implementing from abstract game, but there's no constraint on this constructor. So I'm going to make this game however I want. The only thing is I need to implement play and reset. That's really the only rule I have here. So now I'm going to go and I'm going to implement play and reset. So I'm going to say define reset. If I reset this game, the way that I want to reset it is I want to take a new number of rounds. So it's totally fine if I put a different parameter here. In some other programming languages, the uh, declaration of the function or the definition of the function needs to match exactly. So in some other languages, you would have to actually put like rounds here. But in Python, this is fine. We can just override it like this. So we're going to say define reset self rounds. And then what I'm going to do is just say self dot rounds is equal to rounds and self dot current round is equal to zero. OK, so this way, sorry, not current round. This will just be round. So this way, if we try to play the game again, it's reset and well, we can play. Perfect. So now that we've done that, what I will do is define my play method. And actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I can probably remove this because we can just make the number of rounds the same. We just need to reset the current round so that we can continue to play. We don't really need to accept a new rounds variable here. So we'll just leave it like that. OK, for play, I'm going to take self. What I want to do is generate a random number, ask the user to guess it. And I want to do this for the number of rounds, right? So I'm going to say while self dot round is less than self dot rounds, I'm going to say self dot round and we're going to plus equals one. So we're going to increment it. We'll say print welcome to round and then this will be round and this will be an F string and we need our self here. So self dot round. That's fine. Let's begin exclamation point. And now we need another while loop. So we got to generate a random number and then we have to have a while loop that keeps asking the user to guess the number until they get it correct. So we have the random uh, module already imported. So I'll say random underscore num is equal to random dot randint. We'll just generate a random integer in the range of zero to ten. OK, and I will now do a while loop and I'll say while true. And I will say guess is equal to input and we'll say enter a number between one and ten. And then we'll say if the guess and we'll convert this to a int. So if the int guess is equal to random num, then break. And before we break, we'll print. You got it. exclamation point. OK, so simple. I'm not going to keep track of how many times it took them to guess the number. This is fine. I just want to implement something so that we can actually see how this works. So we'll just quickly run through the code, make sure it's clear. So we are initializing uh, our game with the number of rounds that we want to play. OK, we then have our reset method, which just sets the current round back to zero so we could replay the game if we want. We now have play. We say, well, self dot round is less than self dot rounds. Increment the current round. We say print welcome to round whatever it is. Let's begin. We generate a random number. We then ask the user to enter a number until eventually they give us the correct number. 
then we go back up here and assuming that we're not at the maximum number of rounds we play again so now let's look at this so here we have the start and we have the end so now the way that we're going to start our game is calling start and when we call start it asks us if we want to play we say yes and then it runs the play method the play method now will be this right i mean at least if we're using it in this class then what happens is under end right the game is ended so once the game is ended we then run self.reset so what i can actually do is at the bottom here and say self.end in lowercase and then this will kind of end the game and reset it uh once this is finished so once the game is done we end it we reset and then we could play again so let's do this let's make an instance of random guesser so let's say game is equal to random guesser and then let's say game dot play now if i run my code uh init is missing one uh positional argument round so i need to pass how many rounds i want so let's just play two rounds for now so let's make this a bit larger let's run okay welcome to round one let's begin enter a number between one to ten five uh no okay let's go with maybe four three two one nope okay let's go with six all right you got it welcome to round two let's begin one two three four five six seven eight nine okay you got it the game is ended and then notice the game ends but i'll just show you that if we wanted to play the game again i could just do game dot play again so now what will happen is we'll play one round game will end and then we'll play again so let's do it now okay welcome to round one one two three okay game is ended welcome to round one let's begin enter a number one two three four five six seven eight nine ten game is ended you got it so we were able to play the game twice there you go that is really all I need to show you related to abstract classes and how you implement an abstract class and the abstract methods. So let's just kind of do a recap here and really discuss everything that we've gone through. So first, this is an abstract class. What makes it an abstract class is the fact that we should never instantiate this. And I'll actually show you an example in a second of what happens if we do instantiate this. Now, inside of this class, we have some concrete implementation. This method is a concrete implementation because we're actually implementing something. We have some code that does something. Same here. Notice, though, both of these methods rely on the fact that a play method and a reset method is defined. Now, since this is an abstract class, I can't really define a play or a reset method because this is abstract game. This just says, OK, I'm a game. I don't know what type of game I am. I'm just some game. And so you need to tell me what type of game I am by defining the play method and defining the reset method if you decide to inherit from me. So this is the abstract class. These are the abstract methods. They're abstract because they are not implemented. And if you try to use them, you will get a not implemented error. That means you need to override them inside of a class that is going to inherit from this abstract class. So now we go to our implementation. This is a concrete class, non-abstract class, a concrete class. This does not have abstract methods inside of it. This is an actual thing that we can use that we're going to create an instance of. And so it is a concrete class. We inherit from abstract game. We define our initialization. We didn't need to do one, but we did define it. We define our reset method and we define play. Now inside of play, this is the main logic for our game. And we call the end method. We didn't need to use this end method, but we did decide to use it to start our game. We call, sorry, did I call play? I really need to be calling start here. Uh, I guess I was calling play. I need to call the start method. My bad. But if I call game dot start, then would you like to play? Yes. And then we can play. Okay. I was wondering why that wasn't there before, uh, but that's the point <laughs> we were going to use the start method. So I apologize about not showing that previously. Uh, let's just close this for right now. We should have been calling start. I was calling play, but should have been calling start before. Anyways, when we call start, what occurs is we actually call the play method, right? And we can use play. So we're using part of this implementation here inside of this class and then this implementation relies on the fact that we've defined this play method so now if we want to implement another game or a bunch of games what we could do is something like this so maybe we have like let's uh for example purpose let's just make a class another game i'm not going to code everything out here but we will inherit from abstract game and for now i'm just going to say pass okay so let's imagine this actually does implement a legitimate game so we have another game and we have random guessing. So maybe what we want to do now is we want to define some loop that plays a bunch of games. So we play one game at a time. We could play a bunch of them. So let's say games is equal to. And then maybe what I'm going to do inside of this games list is I'm going to define an instance of random guesser and an instance of another game. And then maybe I have a bunch of other games as well. And they all inherit from abstract game. 
Now, since all of these inherit from abstract game, what I can do is say for game in games, game dot start. That's what I can do. And the reason I know I can do that is because all of these inherit from abstract game. So I know this start method works. I know the start method exists. And then the start method relies on the play method of both of these classes to actually implement the game. So that's fine. I could do something like this. And that would be kind of a use case of actually doing this inheritance hierarchy and having this abstract base class. I hope that kind of helps you see a use case here. But the point of this is that if we have a ton of games, we don't care anything about the implementation of the games since they all inherit from abstract game. We know we can use the start method. And so all of these games, we start them the same way by calling dot start. And then they implement the way that they're actually going to be played. All right. So continuing from there, I was going to show you what happens if we try to use these methods on a class that inherits from the abstract class, but doesn't implement them. So another game does not implement play or reset. In fact, it doesn't implement anything. We're just inheriting from abstract game. So watch what actually happens if I run this. So let's just make this another game and then random guesser like that. So we'll just switch the order. So now we should be running another game first. So if I try to do this and I do yes, notice we get a not implemented error. You must provide an implementation for play, right? So we called game.start. That's fine. The start method works. So we entered yes. And then we called self.play, but we used this play method. And since we are using this play method, it says you must provide an implementation for play. Whereas when we had this one, it was using this play method, the one inside of its class. So even though we're calling self.play here, it's still going to use this play method because this is defined inside the class and we're overriding the one that is here. So hopefully that's a decent example to better illustrate this. But that is what happens if you try to use those methods without implementing them. Well, you get an exception. All right. So with that said, that does cover pretty much everything I need to talk about in this video. Now, I just want to mention before we end here that this stuff is complicated and this is difficult. Please do not feel bad if you are having trouble understanding some of this. This is stuff that does require a lot of practice and that maybe you have to watch the video two or three times to really fully understand and grasp. The point of these lessons and of these videos is to introduce you to these topics, hopefully give you all of the knowledge that you possibly need, and then allow you to have some practice and really fully understand this through that practice, right? By actually creating an abstract base class, by using that base class, by implementing these methods. And so I would encourage you, if you're having difficulty with this, maybe consider watching the video a few times or going through the practice that we have here on Programming Expert. You also can mess around with your own examples. You can write the same code that I have here on your own in your own text editor and see if that's maybe helpful to you as well. Regardless, I just wanted to mention that this stuff is difficult and challenging. It's not expected that you understand it immediately. Please take your time and make sure that you do understand it before moving on to anything that is more complicated. With that said, I am going to end the video here. I hope that you found this helpful. I look forward to seeing you in another Programming Expert lesson. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Programming Expert. In this video, I'll be covering interfaces. Now, an interface is really like an abstract class, except it contains only abstract methods. So an interface contains no implementation details whatsoever. It has no code other than the definition of methods, and then it will raise the not implemented error inside of every single one of those methods. So the point of an interface is to just outline and describe all of the methods that anything that inherits from that interface or implements the interface must implement. Now, interfaces are very, very useful in programming languages like Java and strongly typed programming languages. In Python, an interface actually isn't a thing. So I'm going to show you how we would make an interface in Python, but it's not truly an interface. This is really just kind of a specialized class is what we're creating. But as I was kind of saying, in other programming languages, you can actually make an interface and you can use the interface keyword. And then there's a whole bunch of rules that will be applied to what you're coding. And so you're actually designing and creating a proper interface. Whereas in Python, we're kind of faking an interface. We're making something that works similarly to an interface, but isn't truly an interface. Hopefully that makes sense. But this is similar to things like private attributes or protected attributes. We're not actually implementing a private attribute. We're kind of just making something that by convention, we're going to treat as a private attribute. Same thing goes with abstract classes, right? We don't have this abstract keyword. And so I can't actually create a true abstract class. I can't 
prohibit people from actually making an instance of that class. But we know based on the convention in Python that we're not going to do that because we named it abstract. Hopefully this is all making sense. Python is a weird language to teach object oriented programming in, but it is a really good language to learn as your first programming language, hence why we chose it for this course. So just keep that in mind. A lot of the stuff that we're going through is very important to know and understand in programming in general, not necessarily Python. All right. So with that said, let's just make an interface and look at a few examples here. So to make an interface, I'm going to say class. I'm going to call this the run interface. Okay. And actually we'll call it the run code interface. Now inside of here, I'm just going to pass for right now. And I just want to mention that I have suffixed this with interface. So just like I had the abstract class previously, I'm putting interface at the end just to denote that this is an interface. You don't have to do this. And in fact, in some of the examples we have here, I don't think we do this. But the point is that I'm just clearly saying this is an interface. So we know that it is one again, not mandatory, just something I'm doing for this example. Now, you can also look at a class and determine that it is an interface if you see that it doesn't have any implemented methods. So if all of the methods are abstract, so they don't have an implementation or they raise the not implemented error, then you kind of know that this is an interface. So this run code interface here is going to be an interface that is meant to be used by things that are runnable. Now, what I mean by runnable is like, let's say we create a class that's meant to model a piece of code. Well, then that code needs to be compiled. It needs to be interpreted, it needs to be executed, whatever. So those are kind of the methods I'm going to put here. And then I'll write a class that actually implements the interface and hopefully it will make more sense. Regardless, let's make a few methods. So I'm going to say define the first method I want is compile underscore code. Okay. So we're going to call this compile code for now. We'll take self. And what do we need to do? We need to raise the not implemented error. Say so you must implement compile code. Now you don't have to put a message here. I am going to put a message, but you don't have to put an error message. Uh, it's usually just considered good practice. Okay. So now that we have this, what I'm going to do is make another method and I'm going to call this. Uh, let's go with execute underscore code self. And then let's raise the not implemented error. You must implement execute code like that. Okay. So this is my interface. This is as easy as it is. Notice all of the methods inside of here do not have any logic inside of them. As soon as I go in and I start doing something like this to find like print name and I go with self and I print something, this is no longer an interface. The reason it's no longer an interface is because this has some logic. This method is actually doing something. I need these methods all to raise the not implemented error. And that's all they should do. They're simply kind of boilerplate. They're here just to denote, hey, anything that implements this needs to implement these methods. Now, you may also hear me saying that a class is going to implement an interface. That is actually the proper terminology for it. Now in Python, we don't actually have interfaces, right? We're kind of making this dummy interface. This is considered an interface, but it's not really. It's actually still a class. So in other programming languages, if you wanted a class to use this interface, what you would do is something like this class. And let's go with go code. And then you would say implements like that. And then you would uh, name the interface. So you'd actually say class go code implements like that. And then you would know that this is an interface. You are implementing the interface. And if you implement the interface, you must implement all of the methods inside of the interface, just like an abstract class. OK, that's the idea. However, in Python, since we don't have this implements keyword, instead, all we do is we inherit the interface. OK, so we say run code interface like that. Perfect. Now, if we were going to have an actual parent class of this class, which sometimes occurs, right? This again, we're not really going to call the parent class. This is the interface that we're implementing. But maybe the Go code was inheriting from some general code class. Then we would want to put the parent class first and then the interface. So the interface would go at the end. I'm not going to discuss exactly why you would need to do that, but it just is so that we know if we're looking at this, okay, this is the interface. This is actually meant to be a proper inheritance class. Again, all of these examples are weird in Python. I'm just trying to go through a few of them and a few of the kind of nuances so you understand what the point of an interface is and how it might be used in a different language. Regardless, we have our Go code, okay? So this class, what is the only rule for this class if it implements the run code interface? Well, the only rule is it must implement both of these methods. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to say define compile code self. I'm just going to print compile Go code, all right? We're not going to go too crazy into the example. OK, so now that we have that, let's say define execute code self and then let's print and we'll just go with execute go code. Perfect. OK, 
Now that we have this class, I'm going to make another class that also implements the interface. I'm going to say class and we'll go with Java code. And now we're going to say compile Java code and then execute Java code. Sweet. So we have our compile and we have our execute. Both of these classes implement this interface. The reason they implement it is they implement all of the methods in the interface. As soon as I do this, this is now invalid. This no longer implements the interface. This code is not going to not work. It's still going to run. It will execute. But if you were in another programming language that did enforce the interface, then you would actually get an error. So if you did this in a language like Java and you were implementing this interface and you didn't implement one of these methods, your code would not even execute. It would crash before. During the compilation stage, it would see, hey, this class implements the interface, but it didn't implement this method. And it would tell you you have to implement that method. OK, just want to make that clear. So let's put this back. All right, so now that we've created both of these classes, they both implement this interface. I will mention that it's totally fine for me to go in here and define some other methods. I can go in and I can do print name, whatever, right? I can make a method and that's that's totally valid. That's fine. The only rule for these classes is that they must implement these methods, but they can implement anything else as well. They can have any other methods. They got an initialization. That's all totally fine. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to make a function. I'm going to call this define and we'll go with Mm, call code or run code or something like that. Let's go with run code. Okay. Now to run code, we first need to compile it and then we need to execute it. So what this is going to do is going to take code and it's going to say code.run or code.compile code, sorry. And then it will say code.execute code. Now the idea here is that I don't know what code is going to be. It could be Java code, it could be Go code, it could be some other type of code. But I need to make sure that whatever object is passed here for code has both the compile code and execute code method on it. Now, in Python, there is not really a good way for me to check this. I can't enforce that what is passed here is a specific type. But in other programming languages, you can do this. So Python, as I've been saying, is a weekly types language. That means the types of objects does matter, but we will still try to run the methods on them even if they don't have that method. OK? like I talked about with duct typing in the previous lesson or not the previous lesson, but two lessons ago. Anyways, in strongly typed languages, you actually need to define what type the parameters of your function are. The way you typically do this is you would write the type and then the name of the parameter. So in a language like Java, you would see something like this int code. And that would mean that this code parameter needs to be an integer. Okay. Now, in our case, what we would actually make this is we would make this be the run code interface type. So in Java, for this function to work properly with both Java code and Go code, the type of this parameter would need to be run code interface, which means the only valid thing to pass to this function is something that implements the run code interface. So I don't care what the object is so long as it has both of these methods. And that means inside of this function right here, I can only use the methods defined inside of the interface. Again, I'm sure this is really weird because we're not working in Java, so it's hard for me to show you that example. But the point is that in Java or other programming languages, you need to define the type of your parameters. And so I could only pass to this something that is of type run code interface. And the only things that are of that type are classes or instances of classes that implement the interface. Then I would be allowed to use these methods. So in Python, there is actually a way to not enforce that a specific type is passed as a parameter, but to give a hint for what type the parameter should be. So this is not enforcing. I can still pass anything as the parameter, but this is kind of giving a hint. Now, the way you do this is with a type hint. Now, a type hint is you put a colon after the parameter, and then you put the type that should be passed. So in this case, the type is going to be run code interface. Notice I don't get an error. This is totally fine. So this is kind of a similar thing to what we'd have in Java. I'm saying, OK, I'm accepting any object that implements the run code interface. So it doesn't necessarily have to be code, but it just has to implement this interface. So now either of these objects, the Go code or the Java code, will be valid for me to pass here. So let's do this. Let's say uh, Go equals, in lower cases, equals Go code. And then let's say run underscore code and not equals. We want to call this. So run code and we'll pass Go. So when I run this, notice that I get compile Go code and then execute Go code. Works totally fine, right? Now let's change this instead of go, let's make Java. Java is equal to Java code. And now if I call this on Java and I run this, it works completely fine. So both of these objects, right? I want to do that. I want to close the terminal. 
both of these classes, so instances of both of these classes are valid for me to pass to this function, and then I can use them based on their interface. So I can use these methods because I know if it is of type run code interface, they're both going to have these methods on them. Now, if we have another method, let's just call this test, okay? Say self, and then we print test like that. Theoretically, inside of here, I should not be able to access this test method. So when I call this on Java, if I do code.test, this would work, right? If I call this function on this Java object, then I know that it has this test method. And so this would work. But in another programming language, this would not work. In a language like Java, you would not be able to do this because we only know that what's passed in here is of type run code interface. I don't know it's of type Java code. I don't know it's of type Go code. I just know it's of this type. And so I can only use the things that 100% are going to be on any uh, any objects of this type, which are these two methods. And so I can't try to use this test method. If I did that, it would break. Now, in this case, since we have duct typing in Python, this works. That's why I was showing you duct typing before. But if I change this now and I pass go, then it's going to crash, right? So if I try to run this, notice we get go code object has no attribute test. OK, so that is kind of really the importance of this interface. Now, with that said, that pretty much concludes everything that I needed to show you. Again, it's very, very hard to give you a real world example of an interface in a programming language that doesn't have interfaces. I'm just trying to explain to you, though, what it is, because we are going to use this in a future section when we start talking about program design and software design. And so you do need to be aware of what an interface is. Now, there is some practice questions on creating interfaces. If I ask you to do that, what I'm asking you to do is create an abstract class that only contains abstract methods that need to be implemented by anything that inherit from. It. So like this, right? This is a valid interface. Now, your interface has no logic inside of it. The whole point of the interface is to act as a type for parameters or for any other kinds of things in other programming languages. And that's why they're not really used in Python. We don't need this. But hopefully this kind of gave you an example. I'm saying, hey, this parameter needs to be of this type. So now if I pass any object to this function, I know it's going to be of type run code interface. So I know I can use these methods on it because any object will have those methods available to it. All right. So with that said, I am going to conclude the video. I hope this was helpful. I look forward to seeing you in another Programming Expert lesson. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Programming Expert. In this video, I'll be covering operator overloading. Now, operator overloading is actually our ability to implement custom operations on our own classes. So for example, I can make a class that I can actually add or subtract with or divide with or use the len function with or index with. You'll see what I mean in a minute when we start going through the examples. But the main idea here is that if I can add two ints together, so say one plus one, these are both objects, right? They're instances of type int. What allows me to add them? Well, what allows me to add them is that the int class itself actually defines the behavior for addition of two int objects. And so I can do this myself on my own custom classes. And then that can allow me to say, add my objects together or subtract my objects or divide my objects or any other of these built in operations in Python. We can also compare objects. We can look at the index of objects. We can take the len of objects. Really, really cool stuff we can do here. And this is kind of the power of operator overloading that you can make your custom objects kind of act like built in objects in Python by implementing these operations. Regardless, let me show you an example and you'll see what I mean. So I want to start by creating a simple class here. And I want to call this class book. Or actually, instead of book, let's go with page. Now, the idea is this will be a page of a book. And so we'll have a bunch of words on this page. And well, this class will just represent a page in a book. So let's define our init. Let's say underscore underscore init. Let's say self. Let's say words. So it's actually the content of the page. And then maybe page underscore number like that. OK, so we'll say self dot words is equal to words and self dot page number is equal to page number. Now, words I'm going to expect is going to be a string, and this will actually be all of the content that's on the page, so the words on the page, and then the page number will be a number, an integer representing, well, the page number. OK, so now we have our page class. So let's make an instance, and let's say page one is equal to page, and let's say this page has the words, Tim is a great 
instructor exclamation point. All right. And then for page number, we'll make this page number one. Now what I'm going to do is have another page. So page two is equal to page and I'll say this is another page and then we'll make this page two. OK, so now that I have this, I want to start talking about what I can do with these pages or what makes sense to do with these pages. So in this example here, I actually want to be able to add these pages together. So I want to be able to do something like page one plus page two. And I want this to give me a new page. So page three that has page one. So whatever the content of page one is and then whatever the content of page two is and then whatever the number of the largest pages that we have, we'll make this just the next page. So in this case, the largest page we have when we're adding is two. And so this one we would make be page number three. So let's actually just implement this and then you'll see exactly how this works. But ideally, I want to be able to use the addition operation. And right now, if I do something like page three equals page one plus page two, you're going to see that we'll get an error. It says unsupported operand type for page and page. So the reason we're getting this is because Python does not know how to add two pages together. We need to tell it how to do that. So let's go ahead and implement that. I'm going to define what's known as a dunder method called add. Now the dunder methods are double underscore methods. OK, so all of the methods we're going to see in this video are special Python methods. They're known as magic methods or dunder methods. They start with two underscores and then they end with two underscores. And there's pretty much a special dunder slash magic method for every single operation you see in Python. So pretty much anything that you can do on a built in type in Python. So like getting the length, indexing, adding, subtracting, uh, iterating, comparing all of these things, you can actually implement that here on your own objects using these special methods. Now, there's a ton of special methods, a ton of dunder methods. I'm going to go through a ton of them in this video, but just know that there is more and really any operation you see, you can probably implement yourself on your own class. You just have to look up the appropriate dunder or magic method. OK, so for this method, like all of our instance methods, this is going to take self. And then since we are going to be adding the way that this is going to work is this first object right here will be self. This second object we need to have as a parameter. So usually I like to name this other. And what this means is, OK, we have our own object, which is the left operand and then the other object, which is the right operand in the addition sign. And so now we have access to both of them and we can add them together. So to add them together, what I need to do is get the words from page one and the words from page two add them together and then I need to change the page number, right? And I need to return a new page object because that's what I'm going to do with this addition. Now you can implement this operation however you like. In fact, in here I can print out hello. And now if I do this, you're going to see when I try to add these two things together, hello actually gets printed out. So really strange, but you can do something like that. Clearly, though, when we're adding two objects, we probably should return something back that would make more sense. So instead, let's do that. So I'm going to say new words is equal to self dot words plus other dot words. OK, so we're going to assume that whatever we're adding to page one is going to be another page. But note that if I try to do something like page page one plus two here, this will crash, right? There's no way that I can add an integer to my page. So if I run this, notice you see int object has no attribute words. And so two comes in as the other parameter and then we get this error. Anyways, we're going to assume that we do have valid pages. So I'm going to add the two page words together. And then what I'm going to do is increment the page number. So I'm going to say new page number is equal to actually the max of self dot page number and of other dot page number. And then we're going to add one to that. So whatever the largest page number is that we have, we'll just add one to that and make that the new page number. Then what I will do is return a new page object that's instantiated with new words and new page number. So now let's have a look at what page three is or the words on page three after we do this addition. So let's do page three dot words like that. OK, so let's run this code and notice we get Tim is a great instructor. This is another page. OK, and now let's print out the page number. So we'll say page three dot page number and we get page number three. Now that I'm thinking about it, though, we should probably add a space in between when we're concatenating these words. So let's do that. And now it looks a little bit better. 
Sweet. So I just implemented the addition operation. Now let's make this a bit larger so we can see everything. So now I can add two pages together, just like I can add integers together, just like I can add floats, just like I can add strings. I can now add pages. So we just overloaded the addition operation on this class right here on the page class. So now we can add pages. All right. So now that we've gone through this example and we've seen the add dunder method, I want to show you a few more dunder methods. But to do that, I need to change the example. So I'm going to clear all of this and I'm going to start writing a new example, which is going to represent a store item. So let's just define the init first, then I'll talk about exactly what we're going to do here. So for all of our items, we're going to take in a name and a price. And then, of course, we'll say self dot name equals name and self dot price equals price. Now, for all of the items in the store, we need to calculate an after tax price. So I'm going to say self dot and then after tax underscore price like that is going to be equal to zero for now. We're going to set this in a method. Anyways, for all of our items, we have tax. So I'm going to say tax is a class attribute is equal to in this case 0.13, which is representing 13%. Where I live in Ontario, we have an HST, a harmonized sale tax, which is 13%. Anyways, let's write a method here that could calculate the after tax price. So we're going to say define and then we'll say set underscore after underscore tax price. Then here we'll just say self dot after tax price is equal to self dot price. And then this is going to be multiplied by one plus and then whatever the self dot tax is. So if we want to calculate the tax, we just need to do one plus whatever it is, multiply the price, and then that will give us the after tax price. So let's now call the set after tax price. I'll say self dot and then set after tax price like this. So we will set this attribute from this method. Great. So now that we have this, I want the ability to actually apply a discount to this store item. So I actually want to return a new store item that is going to give me the discounted price and the discount will be a set number. So you know how, how on some items you get something like five dollars off or ten dollars off or something along those lines. The way I want to represent that is I want to be able to subtract an amount from my store item and then get a new store item that represents this price after the discount. So let's start by actually initializing a store item. I'm just going to go with bread is equal to and then store item and then this will be bread. And for the price of the bread, let's say this is an expensive loaf and it will be seven dollars. OK, so we'll just make it seven like that. Now, what I would like to be able to do is subtract an amount from this bread. This amount could be something like two or three, some dollar amount, and then get a new store item back that represents the discounted price. So let's go ahead and do that. So to be able to actually write something like bread minus two, I need to implement the sub dunder method. So I'm going to say define underscore underscore sub underscore underscore. Now I'm going to take in self and then we'll take in discount like this. Now we're going to assume that discount is an integer. We won't check that for right now, although we could. And what I will do is simply return a new store item that represents the price minus the discount. So I'm going to say return and then this will be store item and it will be the same name, but it will be the self dot price minus the discount that we passed in here. So let's try this out. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say uh, let's go discounted underscore bread is equal to bread minus two. Now let's just print out the discounted bread. And then we'll say dot after tax price because we want to figure out what the price is after the tax has been applied. OK, let's run this and notice we get five point six four and then a bunch of numbers like this. So one thing that we can actually do here is we can round the after tax price. So let's just go with round and we're going to round this to two decimal places. So we'll just put a two like that. Let's run this now and notice we're getting five dollars and sixty five cents for the price of this bread after tax after we have applied the discount. So that is the sub dunder method. It allows us to subtract a value from our store item. Now, in this case, we're subtracting an integer, but we could subtract another store item if we wanted to. That just doesn't make a ton of sense in this example. So now that we have looked at sub, what I want to do is look at mole, which allows us to multiply. So in the same way that sometimes we want to subtract a flat value as kind of a discount on an item. So in this case, two dollars off, we may want to actually multiply the price of this item by something like 0.8. That means this item is going to be 20% off, right? If we multiply it by 0.8, then we're saving 20%. So let's see how we can now multiply the price of this item. I'm going to say define underscore underscore mole underscore underscore. I'm going to take in self and I'm going to take in. Let's go with just a value like that. Now, all we're going to do is we're going to adjust the price by multiplying it by the value. So we're just going to return a new store item. This will be the same name, but it will be the 
self dot price multiplied by whatever the value is. Now interpret this however you like. I'm just trying to show you the mole dunder method. So now let's change our example here and we can actually leave it as discounted bread. But instead of subtracting two, I'm just going to multiply this by 0 0.8. So again, this is going to be saving us 20 percent because we're multiplying the price by 80 percent. OK, let's run this now and let's see what we get. Notice we now get six dollars and thirty three cents. So by applying the two dollar discount, that actually saved us more money than by having the 80 percent of the original price. Now let's try multiplying it by 0 0.5. Notice now we're getting 395 because our price is going to be, I guess, about 350. And then we're going to add the tax to it after we do this multiplication. Great. That allows us to use the multiplication on store item. So now we have seen the sub dunder method and the mold under method. I'm going to clear this example and we're going to move on to something else. And I will show you division and a few other methods we can use. So for this example, I'm actually going to make a class called line. Now, a line is comprised of two points, right? So we have one point, the starting point and the ending point, and then we can generate a line from those two points. So in this case, for my initialization, I'm going to say that I will take point one and point two, and I'm going to assume that both point one and point two are going to be tuples with X, Y. So we'll have the X coordinate and then we'll have the Y coordinate for our points. And then using those, we can generate, say, the length of the line and a bunch of other stuff. So inside of here, what I will do is say self dot point one is equal to point one and self dot point two is equal to point two. Now, what I will do is implement the division operation on this line. Now, this is going to be a little bit weird. How do I divide a line? But for this example, all I'll do is I'll take my points. I'll take the coordinates inside of my points and I will divide those by whatever the factor is that I'm dividing it by. So let's do this. We're going to say define underscore underscore. And then what I want to do is true div. So true div is your regular division. OK, so it is just the one forward slash, whereas we have the floor div and the floor div is your integer division. So double slashes like that. OK, so it's weird because you would assume it would just be div, but it's not. It's actually true div. So make sure you do that if you want just one slash. So the regular division and then you do floor div if you want your integer division. OK, so we're going to do true div. We're going to take in just like before self and then I'll call this factor because that's more fitting. And then we're just going to return a new line that has these points modified. So let's actually modify these points, which is a little bit more complicated than it looks. We're going to say new underscore point is equal to and we'll say new point one actually because we need to do this for both points is equal to and then this will be self dot point one and this is going to need to be at index zero divided by, you know, will be divided by the factor, not multiplied by the factor as well. And then after this, we're going to say self dot point one at index one over factor. OK, so we're creating a new tuple. We have self dot point one over factor, self dot point one over factor. We're getting the X coordinate here and we're getting the Y coordinate here. Again, that's because we're going to have a tuple for our points. So the point will look like X, Y like that. OK. So that is point one. Now for point two, this is going to look almost the exact same, except we just need to change all of this to say point two. Great. So now we have our new points. So what we can do is return a new line and this line will have new point one and new point two. Great. So let's try this out. What I'm going to do is make a line. So I'll say line one is equal to line and let's pass maybe 10 and five and 20 and 10 as the two points for our line. Now let's see if we can divide the line and see what it looks like. So let's say line two is equal to and then this will be line one divided by two. And then what we can do is print out line two dot point one and line two dot point two. All right. So let's see what we get here. When I run this, we get 5.0 and 2.5 and 10.0 and 5.0 because we've divided all of the coordinates by two. There we go. That is how you do regular division. Now let's see how we do integer division. So I'm actually going to copy this exact thing here. And now instead of true division, we want to have floor division. So now that we have floor division, we're going to just change the sign to be integer division. We actually don't need to do anything else. And now if we do the integer division of two and we run this, notice we're actually getting integers here instead of floats. And if we change this to say something like nine, so it doesn't evenly divide. Now we get four instead of five. Great. So that's how you do regular division and integer division. 
Now that we've done that, I want to look at the length of this object. So how do we actually run, say, something like the len of line one? Right now, if I do this, notice that we get an error. But I can implement a len method, a special double underscore dunder magic method in Python that allows me to use this len function. So to do that, I can do underscore underscore len underscore underscore. And then all I need to take is self. And what I will do inside of here is return the length of my line. So to calculate the length of the line, we need to use the following formula. This formula is going to be math.sqrt. So since we're using the math module, we need to import math. So we say import math like that. And we'll actually say that the distance, so dis is equal to math.square root. And then this is going to be of self.1 at zero. And then this is minus self.2 at index zero and then squared. So we need to square this. So inside of here, we're going to say to the exponent two. So we can actually put this as, let's say, distance x is equal to that. And then we'll say distance underscore y is equal to self dot point. And then this will be one at index one minus self dot point two at index one. And then yes, again, to the exponent two. And then we need to take the square root of the distance x plus the distance y, and that will give us the length of this line. So let me just quickly go through this formula in case you are not familiar with it. What we're doing is calculating the distance between the x coordinates on this line. So we're taking point one and we're subtracting it from point two, and then we're raising this to the exponent two. So even if this is a negative value, it will become positive when we square it. So we're just getting the distance in the x coordinates. Then we're getting the distance in the y coordinates. Again, we're going to square this. So even if this value is negative, it will then become positive. We're then going to add these two values together and take the square root of it. This is very similar to calculating the distance or the length of the hypotenuse of a triangle. So that's kind of exactly what we're doing right here. And then we can simply return the distance. Let's just be consistent and name this distance. And that will be the length of our line. So now let's actually print out the len of line one and see what we get. And float object cannot be interpreted as an integer. OK, that's interesting. Let me have a look here and see what the error is. All right, so I was just examining this error here, and I realized that what the problem is, is that this len method must actually return an integer. So this is just a rule when we have this len method, this special dunder method. This was actually one that I wasn't aware of until this problem occurred. But from len, you must return an integer, which does kind of make sense because traditionally len is used to give you the length of an object and you shouldn't have a fractional length unless you're doing an example like ours where you have a line. So what I'm going to do to fix this problem is I'm just going to round this distance value to the nearest integer. So I'll just say round distance like that. And now we shouldn't have a problem. And when we do this, we should print out 11. Perfect. There we go. That is how you implement len. And just keep in mind, it must return an integer. Sweet. So now that we've done that, we've looked at len, we've looked at add, we've looked at subtraction, multiplication, and all of the division. I'm going to start showing you how we can check for equality for our objects. So how I can see if line one is equal to line two, or if line one is greater than line two, or whatever I would like to do. So let's go ahead and implement those operations. So for now, I'm just going to get rid of true div and floor div because I don't think we need those right now. I will leave len and now I'll show you how we can implement the double equal sign operation. So the comparison operation. So before I actually show you the dunder methods for comparison, so specifically the double equal sign and the not equal to sign, what I want to talk about is what happens when you compare different objects and you don't implement that. So let's create another line here and let's call this line two. Now let's make it identical. So it has the same property for point one and the same property for point two. Now let's compare line one to a line two. And I want you to take a guess at what you think the output is going to be. So go ahead, take a guess. I'm going to run the code and notice here that if I scroll down, we actually get false. Now this is a little bit strange. Why am I getting false? These lines look like they are identical. In fact, they have pretty much the same value. Well, the reason why I'm getting false here is because when I compare with two equal signs and I have not implemented the double equal sign operation or the double equal sign dunder method, we're actually going to compare and check if these two objects are the exact same. Now, these objects are different. 
line one and line two are separate objects. They just so happen to have the same values, right? I've created a new instance here. I've created a new instance here. These are different objects. Now, if I do something like this, I say line two equals line one and I run this. Now we get true because line one and line two are actually the exact same object. So think back to that mutability lesson where I talked about the same object and creating a reference to or a copy of the same object. That's exactly what this is doing. Line two is storing line one. And so any change you make to line one will happen to line two because they are the same object. But when I do this, now we have two separate objects that have the same value. And so that's why we need to actually implement our equal sign operation. So the double equal sign, because typically when you use two equal signs, you want to check for the value, not for the exact same object. So I would like this to return true because line one and line two, even though they're separate objects, they have the same properties, they have the same values. But since I haven't implemented that Dunder method yet, as you can see here, we're getting false because we're going to by default compare and see if these are the same objects. Running this is actually the same as doing this ID of line one is equal to the ID of line two. Now, if I run this, we can see that, of course, we're going to get false again. And if I actually change this now to rather than using the ID, and rather than using the double equal sign and I use is you're going to see that we'll get false again. So when you use the double equal sign on two objects and they have not implemented the underscore underscore equal method, which I'm going to show you in a second, then you're going to compare and see if they're the same identical object, which in this case they are not. Now, of course, the reverse is going to happen when you use does not equal to. So if I use this here, notice we get true because, well, these are not the exact same object. Hopefully that makes sense. I just wanted to show you kind of the purpose of actually implementing this underscore underscore equal method and this underscore underscore not equal to method, which you will see right now. So actually, let me just go back to the example that we had previously. So I'm going to get rid of all of this and we'll just print out the len of line one. And now we will continue and I will show you the comparison operator overloads. So to implement comparison, the method that you want to use is to find underscore underscore EQ underscore underscore. OK, so this stands for equals. And then I'll quickly show you that to do not equals, you do underscore underscore. And then this is N E underscore underscore. So we'll implement this one as well. So for now, we can just put pass and we can fill in the argument. So self and other. And then this will be self and other as well. So this method needs to return true or false, indicating whether or not the other object is equal to the current object. So how are we going to implement this? Well, the first thing that we usually do inside of the equal method is we check if the other object is the same type as the object we're comparing it to. So in this case, we want to see if other is actually a line, because if I try to do something like, let's say line one equals equals three, well, we're going to get an error if inside of here I'm using, say, other dot something, right? Other dot. Let's go with point one. This would return an error because other does not have a point one attribute because it is not a line. But if it is of type line, then we know that we can actually check point one and check point two. And so we won't get an error. So what I'm trying to say is that we need to do something like this. So if not is instance other line like this, then return false. So now if other is not an instance of the line class, we'll immediately return false. But otherwise, that would mean that it is an instance of the line class. And so down here, we can actually check if this other object is the same line. So for equality, two lines are the same if their two points are the same. So what I can actually do is simply return self dot point one is equal to other dot point one and self dot point two is equal to other dot point two. That's fine. We're just going to compare these two tuples see if they are the same. So if X, Y is equal to X, two and Y, two for both point one and point two. And well, if that is the case, then we will return true. Otherwise, we will return false. OK, so that is equals. So let's actually see if this works now. Let's print out. First of all, line one is equal to three. When I run this, we get false. And now let's see if line one is equal to line one. In this case, it is because, well, they have the same points. Now let's make another line. And let's say line two is equal to line. And now let's check if line one is equal to line two. Yes, they are. And let's change one of the coordinates now and see if they're still equal. And no, they are not. All right. So that is how you implement the comparison using the double equals. Now let's do it with not equals. Now to do with not equals is pretty easy. All I'm going to do is return the not of self dot underscore underscore EQ underscore underscore other. 
So I did mention this previously, but you can still call these Dunder methods. Yes, using the double equal sign will trigger this method to run. But you can manually call it as well. So this is totally fine. There's no need for me to rewrite all of this code. I'll just take the negation or the not of whatever this gives me. So if two things are equal and I'm calling the not equal, then we'll just reverse that and we'll return false because they're the same. Whereas if they are not the same, then I will return true. That's it for not equals. So now let's change this to not equals and see if this works and notice that we get true. Sweet. All right. So now that I've showed you that, let's start implementing some other comparison operations. So like greater than, less than and all those other ones. So I'm going to start with greater than. So we're going to do underscore underscore GT underscore underscore. And we're going to take self and up. So I want to see if some object or some line is greater than the other line. Now, how should I do this? Well, there's a few ways that you could think about doing this. You could look at, say, the starting coordinate or the ending coordinate. But in my case, I'm going to keep it really simple and I'm just going to look at the length of the lines and I'm going to say whatever line has the largest length is the greater line. So we'll just compare the lengths of the two lines. So that actually makes it really easy for me. What I can do is simply return the len of self is greater than the len of other. And then this will be a condition. So it will evaluate to true or false based on what len gives us. Now, this is totally fine. I can call the len directly on self and directly on other. That's the exact same thing as me going down here and calling it on, say, line one, right? Because if we're saying line one greater than line two, well, line one is self, line two is other. And so it's totally fine for me to call it the length on. Great. So with that said, let's actually check if line one is greater than line two. So let's run this and notice we get false. So line one is smaller than line two, according to this. And if I'm looking at this here, uh, the reason why we're going to get this is because we're going to have a rounded value. So technically, line one would be a little bit longer than line two. But since this is returning the rounded distance, we're going to say that they are approximately the same. So this is a little bit flawed because we have to return the rounded distance. We could instead, if we wanted to copy all of this, put it inside of here and then we could compare the distance. But then we would have to do this for both line one and line two. So for now, let's just keep it simple and return this. All right. So now let's just do an example and see if we can actually make one of these lines shorter or make this line shorter so that this evaluates to true. So instead of nine here, let's just go with 20 so that the X coordinates are very close to each other. And now when I run this, notice we get true. Line one is longer than line two. All right. So that is greater than we also have underscore underscore GTE, which is greater than or equal to. So let's go with self and other like that. And sorry, it's not GTE. It's just a GE. My apologies. And notice that these methods are highlighting a special color, kind of telling us that, hey, these are the special dunder or magic methods in Python. Regardless to do greater than or equal to, all we need to do is return this exact same thing, except now we're going to do greater than or equal to. So now let's swap this to greater than or equal to. Let's go back to this. So these actually are the same line now. And let's see. Notice we get true. Great. And then if I make this 20, we get true as well. But if I make this say zero, then we get false. Sweet. So that is working. So now that we've done GT and GE, we're going to do LT and LE. So less than and less than or equal to. So define underscore underscore LT underscore underscore self other. And then here we will return the len of self is less than the len of other like that. OK, and then we'll do the same thing. But this is going to be less than or equal to. So LE and then less than or equal to. I'm not going to go through the example because we already just looked at greater than or equal to and greater than. So this will work the exact same way, just in the reverse order. That is how you implement the comparison operations. So these six methods right here, kind of the ones you need to know, equal, not equal to, greater than, greater than or equal to, less than, less than or equal to. Sweet. So now we have gone through almost everything that I need to show you. There's just three more special methods to look at. And to look at these ones, I'm actually going to go through a new example. So let's clear all of this. Let's just remove the console for right now and let's make a new example. So let's actually create two classes here. I'm going to say class page and we'll put pass for right now and then class book. Now, these two classes will work together where a book will have multiple pages. So let's define the init for our page. Let's say underscore underscore init. Let's take in self. Let's take in some text and let's take in a page number. Now we can say self dot text equals text and self dot page number equals page number. Great. Now, the first thing I want to do is just implement the len method on my page because I want to show you a better example of using len than what we had previously. So I'm going to say define underscore underscore len self like that. 
And all I'm going to do is return the len of my self.txt. Now, what this will give me is the number of characters that is on the page, which makes sense here for the length of a page. Great. So now let's go to book. Now for a book, what I want to have in my net is I want to have a title. I want to have an author and I want to have some pages. Now, what I may also want to have is maybe an ID of this book. So I'll go with something like ID number. This could be a unique number that we use to represent the book in case other books have a similar title or a similar author. So inside of here, let's say self.title equals title, self.author equals author, self.pages equals pages, and of course, self.id number equals ID number. Now, pages, I'm actually expecting to be a list that contains page objects. OK, that's how we're going to initialize our book. So for now, let's implement the len on our book as well. Now, what should the length of our book be? Well, that should probably be the number of pages that it has. So I'm going to return the len of self dot pages. Great. Now that we have this, let's just create an example of a book and some pages. So let's say page one is equal to page. And then for our text, we can just go with something very simple like page one exclamation point and put a one. Let's copy this and let's make page two. And we will say this is and then page like that number two. And we'll put a two here. OK, so we now have the two pages in our book. Now I want to create the book and actually add it to it. So I'm going to say book is equal to book. Let's go with the title of this book being Tim is great. Very true title. Let's go with the author of Tim. Let's go with a list containing page one and page two and then the ID number of one. OK, so we have just initialized a book. Now let's start by looking at using the length method on the book and our pages. So let's print out the len of page one and see what we get. OK, let's run the code and notice that we get seven. That is accurate. That's the number of characters that is in page one. Let's change this to page two. Print this out and notice we get 50. Now let's look at the len of our book. We should see that we get two because we have two pages in our book. Perfect. So now that we have looked at len, what I want to do is show you two new methods, the string method and the wrapper method. Now, first, I want to show you what happens when I try to print out page one or print out book. So one of my custom objects. Let's have a look at this. Let's print page one. Notice when I do this, I kind of get some gibberish coming here in the console. I get main dot page object. OK, I understand this is a page object and then at some memory address location. This doesn't really mean anything to me. And if I print both page one and page two, it's pretty much impossible for me to distinguish between these two pages other than by looking at this number, which is relatively meaningless. Now, the reason why we're getting this is because when I try to print out page one and page two, what happens is we actually call the string function on both of these objects. Now, since we have not implemented the functionality for this string function, what occurs is we just print out this. Right, it's kind of internal representation, which is the main dot page object at its memory address location. But what I can do is I can override the string function for my book or for my page so that when I print it out, I actually get something that's meaningful, a string representation of it. So let's start with our page. So I'm going to go here and implement the underscore underscore string underscore underscore method. What this does is it will be called when you call the string function on this page. Now, that also means when you try to print the page, since when you print it, it will in turn call the string function. OK, so inside of here, what I'm going to do for now is I'm just going to return the text of this page. We also could do something else here, which I will show you in a second. But you just need to return some type of string. So now if I return the self dot text and I run this, notice I get page one and then I get this is page two. Because when I call that string function, we're going to go to this dunder method and we will return the self dot text. And that is what we're going to display. Great. Now, one other thing that you will typically see inside of these string functions, so underscore underscore string, sorry, method, my bad, is something like this. You will have an F string. You will have actually the name of the class, which in this case is page. And then you will define all of the attributes that you take in the init for this object. So you will have something like self dot text and then self dot page number like that. Now, sometimes you may also see something like text equals. So you might get that. And then you might have something like page underscore number is equal to that. Now, what is going wrong here? I believe I have a period. That is why. Anyways, the point of this is that now I'm actually able to see all of the information of this page and I know that it is of class page. So let's just run this and see what we get. Notice we get page text equals page one page number equals one. 
we get page text equals this page two and page number equals two. Okay, so that's another thing you could do for the string representation of an object. Now let's do one for book. So what do we want the string representation of the book to be? Well, we probably want to print out the title, the author, and then all of the pages and most likely the ID number as well. So I'm going to say define and then I'll say underscore underscore string. We will take in self and we'll do a similar thing to what we did for the page. We'll turn F string. We'll say book. And rather than having this text equals and this page number equals, because that's just going to make our line very long for now, we'll just print out the attributes. So we'll say self dot title self dot author and then we'll do self dot ID number. And I'm actually going to store this for now in a variable called output. Now, the reason is because I'm going to actually represent the pages a bit differently here because we have a bunch of different pages and the pages all have their own string representation. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say output plus equals and then I'm going to add all of the pages. But since I have multiple pages, I need to loop through them and then add them to the book. And I want them all to be on their own line. So you'll see how I'm going to do this in a second. But for now, I'm going to go with four and we'll say page in self dot pages. And then what I'm going to do is say output plus equals and then the string of the page. But before that, I'm going to actually add an escape character. So I'm going to say the escape character plus string page n. And sorry, this is a new line character. Actually, the point of this is to make every single page go on a new line. Then I can return my output. So let's have a look at what I've done here. I have the start of my output being equal to book, the title, the author and the ID number. And then for every single page that I have, I'm going to put that on a new line in this string that I'm going to return. Now, what I'm doing is getting the string of the page. So we're actually going to call this string dunder method. And that means we'll see this string representation for every single page underneath our book. Great. Let's give this a shot. So let's print out our book and see what we get. Let's just make the console a bit bigger. We can clear this and let's run the code. Notice we get book. Tim is great. Tim one. And then we have page page one one page. This is page two and number two. Perfect. That's exactly what I want. Great. So now that we have that, I'm going to show you another method that we can override, which is known as wrapper. Now, the wrapper method looks like this is define underscore underscore wrapper underscore underscore like this. And it is very similar to this underscore underscore string, except this is meant to represent the internal representation of an object. So when we have this string method, really what we use this for is representing a string readable or a human readable kind of version of our object. So that's why we've gone with page. We've actually put the self dot text. We've added the page number. We're giving something that's very friendly, easy to read and that humans can understand. That's the point of it, because we're likely going to output this to the console or be viewing it somewhere. Whereas with wrapper, what we actually want to do is give all of the important information about the object that we need when we are debugging or when we're looking at the internal representation of it. So the internal representation is not necessarily the friendliest thing to look at. Usually it's meant to have kind of the important information of the object. And again, we're going to use this when we're debugging. Now, for now, we don't really have a good use of wrapper, but I will show you how to manually activate this wrapper method when you are not debugging your code. Anyways, inside of here for right now, all I'm going to do is I'm going to return F page and I'm actually just going to return the exact same thing. So what I can do if I'm going to return the same thing is just say self dot underscore underscore string underscore underscore. The reason why I'm going to do this is because I don't really have any special stuff that I need to show for this page. It's string representation is pretty much the same as what its internal representation would be. So I'll just return self dot underscore underscore string. Now for my book, though, this will be a little bit different. When I'm looking at the internal representation of the book, I may not necessarily care about all of the pages that I have, the title, the author. In fact, what I might actually want is just the ID number of this book. That's probably the information that I'm going to use if I'm trying to debug this book and I'm printing it out from its internal representation or looking at the internal representation. So let's do something different for the wrapper in our book. Let's say self and let's just simply return. And for now, we'll go with F and we'll go with book. And then inside of here, we'll just say self dot and then ID number. And we can do something like ID underscore number is equal to that just so that we know this is the ID number. There's all kinds of other stuff we could return here. But for now, I think that makes sense. So I'll show you here that if I print out the book now, I'm still going to get the same thing that I got before. Again, that's because I'm activating the string method of my book. 
However, if I want to look at the representation, so the wrapper, what I need to do is print out the wrapper. So if I print out wrapper, as you can see, when I highlight over this, it says return the canonical string representation of the object for many object types, including most built ins. And then it gives you this thing, which you don't really need to worry about. Anyways, let's run this and let's see. Notice we get book and ID number equals one. So we're getting something different than the string because, of course, we're manually calling the wrapper method. All right, so now what I want to show you to kind of end off this video is just looking at the internal representation. So the wrapper of some built in Python objects. So let's start by looking at a list. Let's do something like one, two, three, four like that. And let's run this. And actually, we got a problem. Oh, that's because I was missing a bracket. So let's run this again and notice that we just get the exact same thing. So for most Python objects, you're just going to get the exact same thing as what the actual value of the object is. When you look at the internal representation, let's try with something like true. Notice we're just getting true. However, for some objects, you will get something slightly different, especially if you're using an object that's coming from some type of Python module that you may have installed. Anyways, with that said, that's pretty much going to wrap up this video. It's all the methods that I needed to go through. As you can see, every single function or every single operation that we perform on an object actually kind of points to or corresponds to an underlying Dunder method. There's a lot more Dunder methods than this. I'm just showing you the core and most important ones. And this is very, very interesting and allows you to have very cool behavior in Python with your objects by using built in operators like multiplication, subtraction, division, the len function, etc. Regardless, I hope you enjoyed this video and I look forward to seeing you in another programming expert lesson. Hello, everybody, and welcome to programming expert. In this video, I'll be going over the solution to the assessment question inventory class. Now, in this question, what we'll be asked to do is to design an inventory class that will represent the inventory for a store or a company. Now, this inventory needs to keep track of different items and their capacities, and we will have a maximum capacity for this inventory. Now, every single item will be represented by a name, a price and the quantity of that item in the inventory. Now, to solve this problem, we need to implement these five methods right here. So the init, the add item, the delete item, the get items in price range and the get most stocked item. Now, I'll talk about what each of these methods are supposed to do before we solve them. But for now, I would recommend you read the prompt before watching this video. Anyways, at this point, I will assume that you have read the prompt. And now we're going to move on and start talking about how we can implement the init method. So the first thing that I need to do here when I design this inventory class is implement the initialization. So I'm going to start by saying that the self dot max capacity is equal to max capacity just to keep track of that. So we know that value inside of the class. Next, I need some way to store all of my items. So I'm going to say self dot items is equal to an empty dictionary. Now, the way I'm going to use this dictionary is I'm going to have the key be equal to the name of the item. And I'm going to have this be associated with another dictionary. And inside of this dictionary, I will have the price, I will have the name again, and I will have the quantity of the item. Now we'll see how this will work in the add item method. But that's kind of the idea behind using a dictionary. This will allow us to very easily see if an item exists by looking it up with its name. OK, so let's go back and make this an empty dictionary for now. Next, I'm going to have an attribute called item underscore count, and this will be equal to zero. Now, the reason I need this is because every single item I add has a quantity. So even if I only have four different types of items, I might have 100 items in my inventory. So I need to keep track of how many individual items, not just the different types of items that I have. And I'll do that in my item count attribute. All right. So now we have finished the initialization and I'm going to move on to add item. So what I need to do in add item is I need to take a name, a price and a quantity and then add this item to the inventory if I can do so. Now, I cannot add the item to the inventory if the quantity here will make it so that I'm going to exceed the maximum capacity of the inventory. If that's the case, I need to return false. I also cannot add this item if an item with this name already exists in the inventory. If that's the case, I need to return false. Otherwise, I'm fine to add the item. So let's handle our two kind of edge cases first where we're not able to add the item. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say if the name is in self dot items. And the reason I can do this is because the key of all of my items will be its name. So I'm going to check if the name is in self dot items. And if it is, I will return false to indicate that I could not add this item to the inventory. This was unsuccessful. Otherwise, I'm going to check if the quantity of this item plus my current item count exceeds the maximum capacity. If it does, again, I cannot add this item to the inventory. 
So I'm going to say if self dot item count, and then this is actually going to be plus, and then this will be the quantity is strictly greater than the self dot max capacity, then I need to return false. If it's equal to the max capacity, that's fine. I can be at max capacity. So now if we get past both of these checks, we know it's fine to add the item to the inventory. So we can say self dot items at the key name is equal to and then we'll just add the item. I'm going to say name name like that. I'm going to say price and then price like that. And then finally, I will say quantity and that will be equal to the quantity. Great. So now I've added this item in the inventory. Next, what I need to do is I need to increment my item count by whatever this quantity was. So I'm going to say self dot item underscore count plus equals quantity. And then I will return true to indicate that I could successfully add this item to the inventory. There you go. That is the add item method. Now we'll move on to delete item. Now with delete item, we're going to take in the name of an item and we're going to delete all instances of this item. So the entire item essentially from the inventory. If it has a quantity of one, four, five, doesn't matter. We'll just completely remove it. So the first thing I need to do is I need to check if this name is in my items. If it is not, then I'm going to return false. So I'm going to say if name not in self dot items, then return false. The reason for this is I can't delete an item from the inventory if it doesn't exist. So I return false to indicate that I didn't delete the item because it wasn't there. Now, if this name is in the inventory, I'm good to continue. So I'll say self dot item and then actually, sorry, this will be item count minus equal. And then I need to find the quantity of this item to subtract it. So I'm going to say self dot items. This will be at name. And then I'm going to access the quantity key, which is going to be a string. So the idea here is I want to figure out how many of these items existed in the inventory and subtract that from my item count because now I'm removing that item. Now I'll actually delete the item. And the way I can do that from the dictionary is using the Dell keyword. So I'll say Dell self dot items and then name. This will then remove the item. And I know I'm not going to get an error because I've already checked to make sure that this name is in the inventory. So it's in items. Then what I can do is I can return true like that to indicate that I successfully deleted this item. So now I have added the add item and delete item method, and I'm going to implement get items in price range and get most stocked item. So the get items in price range is fairly straightforward. We want to return a list of all of the items that are within this price range. So what I need to start by doing is making an empty list and call this item names is equal to this. Then what I'm going to do is loop through all of my different items, and I'm actually only going to add the name of the item to this item names. If you're unsure of why I'm doing that, read the prompt. But that is what it asks me to do. Return the names of items that are within the price range, not just the entire item. So now I'm going to say for item like this, and then this will be in self dot items and then dot values like this. So the reason I want to do this is because I want to actually get this dictionary. So the dictionary representing my item. And the way I get that is by looping through all of the values, not by looping through the key value pairs. So now when I say item, I'll get the entire item. I won't just get the name of this item or the name and the dictionary because I just want the dictionary representing the item. Then what I want to do is I want to access the name of the item and the price of the item. So I'm going to say name is equal to and then this will be item and we'll be at the key name. Then I will get the price. I'll say price is equal to item at key price. And then I will check if this price is within this min price and max price range. So I'm going to say if the min price is less than or equal to price, less than or equal to maximum price, then what I want to do is add this name to my item names because I want to return this item. Its price was in the correct range. So I'm going to say item names dot append and then name like that. Finally, I will return my item names and I've now implemented this method. So again, all we're doing is looping through all of the values in the dictionary. We're getting every single item. So this will be a dictionary representing the item. We'll access the name. We'll access the price. We'll check if the price is in the range. If it is, we will add that to our item names and then we will return item names. All right. Now that we've done that, we need to implement the get most stocked item. So what we're looking for here is the item that has the largest quantity. So I'm going to say the most underscore stocked underscore item underscore name is equal to none to start because right now we don't have the most stocked item. We don't know what it is. Then I'm going to say the largest underscore quantity, if I can type this correctly. So quantity like that is going to be equal to zero. So the idea is I'm going to loop through all of my different items and I'm going to grab the item or determine the item that has the largest quantity and update these two values right here. If I ever find an item that has a larger quantity than the one that currently has the largest quantity, I will update this. 
and update this with that quantity. Now you'll see what I mean, but let's loop through our items. I'm going to say for item in self.items.values. Again, we're going to loop through just the values and we're going to get the name and the quantity of the item. So I can actually copy the name right here. I'll paste that in. And then I want to say the quantity is equal to item and then at quantity. Now, very similarly to what I did here, I'm going to check if this quantity is larger than the largest quantity. If it is, then I will update the most stocked item name and the largest quantity. So I'm going to say if the quantity that I'm looking at now of this item is greater than the largest quantity I currently have, then I want to say the most stocked item name is equal to name and the largest quantity is equal to the current quantity that I found. Then all I need to do here is simply return the most stocked item name. So just a quickly note here, in this method, we are not handling the situation in which we have multiple items that have the same quantity, and that quantity actually happens to be the largest quantity. So for example, we're not going to handle what happens if we have two items that have, say, a quantity of four, and that happens to be the largest quantity. The reason why we don't need to handle that is because in the prompt, it specifically says that we will always have at least one item that has the largest quantity. So we'll never be given a situation where there's items that have the same quantity, and that happens to be the largest quantity. So keep that in mind. That's why we're not handling it in this method. So with that said, that is actually going to conclude this solution. That's everything that I needed to show you. And this covers creating the inventory class. So let's quickly run through it and make sure we understand what is going on. So we start by writing the initialization method. We take in the maximum capacity. We then set the maximum capacity to be equal to max capacity. We then say self.items equals a dictionary. We're going to use a dictionary to store our different items. We then keep track of the item count by using self.item count, and we're going to initialize that at zero. Then we have our add item method. Now here we take a name, price, and quantity that represents an item in the inventory. Now we say if the name is in self.items, return false. So if an item with this name already exists, simply return it. And then we say if self.item count plus quantity is greater than the self.maximum capacity, return false. What this is saying is if we are going to add this item and this results in the quantity being larger than our maximum capacity, then we need to simply return false because we don't have any more room in our inventory. Now, if we get past both of these checks, we can add the item to the inventory by just adding a new key in the dictionary, and we can increment the item count by the quantity of this item and then return true to indicate this was successful. Now we go to delete item. We say if the name is not in self.items, return false. So if the item we're trying to delete does not exist, then we need to return false. Otherwise, what we can do is subtract from the item count the quantity of the item we're about to delete. Then we can delete that item and return true. Next, we have get items in price range. We take in a minimum price and a maximum price. And one thing to note here as well is that the minimum price and the maximum price are guaranteed to be valid input. So we don't need to actually check to see if, say, the maximum price is below the minimum price or something along those lines. We know that these are going to be valid integers and that they will be valid. So we don't need to handle that in this method. Anyways, we then define the item names as an empty list. We loop through all of the items, specifically the value. So we're just accessing each dictionary. We then get the name and the price of this item. And then if the price is within the accepted range, then we're going to say item names dot append, add the name. And then finally, we'll return our item names at the end of the method. Moving on, we have get most stocked item. Now, in this method, we are going to start by defining the most stocked item name equal to none. The reason why we need to do this as well is because theoretically, we could have no items in the inventory. And if that's the case, it's fine to return none because, well, there is no most stocked item. We have no items. Anyways, we then set the current largest quantity that we found equal to zero. And then we loop through every single item again by looping through the item values. Then we get the name of the item, the quantity of the item, and we check if the quantity is greater than the current largest quantity that we found. If that's the case, we update these two values. Finally, once we get through this for loop, we will have found the item with the largest quantity, and then we simply return it. All right. So with that said, that is going to conclude this video. I hope you found this helpful, and I look forward to seeing you in another Programming Expert video. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Programming Expert. In this video, I'll be going over the solution to the assessment question student class. Now, in this question, we'll be asked to design a student class that can keep track of all of the students that it's currently graded, as well as the name and the grade of these students. Now, there's a few methods that we need to write. I'll go through those methods as we continue in this solution. So let's go ahead and get started by implementing the initialization method of this student class. I'm going to say self.name is equal to name. And I'm going to say self.grade is equal to grade so that we can store these as attributes for this instance. 
The next thing that we need to do is we need to keep track of all of the student instances that we create. So as soon as we create a student instance, we want to add it into a class attribute that stores all of our students. Now, as it says in the prompt, we need to make a class attribute called all students like this that is equal to and then an empty list to start. Now we'll append all of our student objects once they are created into this list. So I will say actually in the initialization student and then it'll be dot all students dot append and then we'll simply append self. Now when we append self that will actually append the student object itself that we just created into this class attribute. So now it can be accessed from anywhere in the class. So now that we've implemented the initialization, what I want to do is implement the property for our students grade. So as it says in the prompt, what we need to do is make it so that when someone accesses our grade, we can get access to it. But when we try to set a student's grade, it doesn't let us set it unless they set a grade that is valid. So something between zero and 100. So how are we going to do that? Well, the first thing that we need to do here, since we're going to be using a property called grade, is we need to change the name of this grade attribute. Now, I want to make this private, so I'm going to put an underscore before it. This way, we are telling people that we want to make this a private attribute so that people do not modify this outside of the body of this class. So now that we've done that, I want to implement the property. Now, there's a few ways to implement the property. I'm going to do it using the decorators. So I'm going to say at property like that, and I'm going to define the name of my property, which is grade. We're going to take in self, and all we need to do is return self dot underscore grade. OK, so now that I've done the getter for the property, I want to do the setter. So I'm going to say at grade dot setter and then I'm going to do define grade like that. Let's spell define properly. And then inside of here, I'm going to take in self and a new underscore grade. Now I'm going to say if the new underscore grade is less than zero or the new grade is greater than 100, then what we want to do is want to raise a value error and tell them that this grade is not valid. So for my value error, I'm just going to say new with a capital grade not in accepted range. And then this accepted range is going to be zero to 100 inclusively like that. So we're just raising an exception if they give us an invalid grade. Otherwise, if they don't give us an invalid grade, we'll say self dot underscore grade is equal to the new grade. We will set this private attribute, which is fine to do because we are inside of the body of this class. We just don't want anyone to do this outside of the class. All right. So now that we've implemented the property for our grade, the next thing that we need to do is implement a few class and static methods. Now, the first class method that we want is something that allows us to get the best student. So we want to figure out which student has the best grade, essentially, and then return that student. Now, it's guaranteed that we will always have one best student, so we don't need to worry about students tying for being the best, otherwise having the same grade. So let's write the class method. Remember, we need to add the at class method decorator before this, and then we're going to say define. This is going to be get underscore best underscore student like that. But we're going to take in CLS because this is a class method, not a instance method. Then inside of here, I'm going to say the best underscore student is equal to none. So this means that if we don't have any students, we'll actually end up returning none. Now, you'll see this in a minute. But for now, let's loop through all of the students that we have and let's figure out which one is the best. So I'm going to say for student in and this is going to be CLS dot all students like this. So this will loop through all of the students that we have in this class attribute. So now that we're looping through all of our students, what we want to do is access their grade and see if it's greater than the grade of the best student that we currently have. So what I need to do is say if the best student is equal to none or the best student dot and then this will be grade is less than the current student dot grade, then what we want to do is set the best student equal to the current student. So the reason why I need this check right here is because if the best student is equal to none, then any student that I find is immediately the best student. So if best student is equal to none, we don't even bother checking this. And in fact, we can't check this because if we did try to check this and access the grade on none, then that would give us an error that would raise an exception. So we first do this check to make sure we're not going to get an exception. And then after we perform this check, if the best student is not equal to none, we know that we actually have a student object here so we can access the grade of that student and compare it to the current student, which is referenced from student. Now, if the current student has a greater grade than the best student that we've currently found, then we say the best student is equal to student. Now, that's all we need to do here. So after this, we can simply return the best student. OK. So that is it for that class method. 
So now that we've implemented this class method, what I want to do is implement the static method we've been asked to implement, which is one that can calculate the average grades of a list of students. So what I'm going to do is say at static method like that, I'm going to say define, and then this is going to be calculate underscore average underscore grade. And we are going to take in a list of students. So recall, we are not taking in CLS or self because this is a static method. This is a function that's sitting inside of this student class. Now, right now, it may seem useless to have this because all of our students are being stored in this class attribute. But the reason we're making this is because in the future, it may be useful to actually have this as a static method and allow us to use this on other objects that have the grade attribute. You'll see what I mean in a second. But for now, just write the static method and calculate the grade of all of our students. So what we're going to do is say if the len of students is equal to zero, then we're going to return negative one. The reason for this is that's what it asked us to do in the prompt. It said if we have no students, then we want to return negative one. So if this list is empty, that's what we'll do. Now, if the list is not empty, then we need to start calculating the total of the grades. So the way that we calculate the average is we simply sum all of the grades together and then we divide by the number of students that we have. So this is going to be the sum of the grades. So I'm going to say for student in students like that, I'm just going to get the grade of the student and add it to total. So I'm going to say total plus equal and then student dot grade. Then I'm going to simply return the total divided by the len of our students, because this is how you calculate the average. So again, we're going to loop through all the students. We're going to get the grade attribute, add that to the total. We'll then have the sum of all of the students grades. Once we finish this for loop, we'll divide by the number of students that we have, and that gives us the average grade. Now, again, the reason why we're doing this as a static method is because in the future, we may be past a list here that is not actually a student object, but that is something or a list of objects, sorry, that has a grade attribute. That way, we can now use this method for different types of objects, specifically anything that has a great attribute. It doesn't just need to be a student. Anyways, what we're going to do now is implement a class method that actually uses this static method. So what we're going to write is at class method, we're then going to say define get underscore, and then this will be average underscore grade. And then this time we'll take in CLS because this is a class method. Now, all we're going to do is use the static method that we just defined to generate the average of all of the students that we have stored inside of the all students class attribute. So this is quite simple. Now we can return and then this will be CLS dot and then calculate average grade. And then we're going to take in the CLS dot all students. So we're going to pass sorry the CLS dot all students. So we're accessing all the students from our class and we are using this static method that we just defined calculate average grade. There you go. That actually finishes this solution. So let's quickly do a recap and make sure we're clear on everything that we just did. So we have a class student. We then have a list here, all students. This is a class attribute that's going to store all of the student instances that we have. We then store the name and the grade of all of our students. We have a private attribute for the grade because we're using a property to actually access this grade. Then we add this student object to the all students list so that we're storing it in there. Then we have our property. This is the getter for our grade property, just returns the grade. And then the setter ensures that when we try to set the grade, that it will be within the valid range. So the new grade must be between zero and 100. If that's not the case, we raise a value error. Okay, let's continue. Move on to this class method. This takes in CLS, which will be the class name. We say that the best student is equal to none. We loop through all of the students that we have in this class. And then we determine which student has the highest grade. Once we determine that, we simply return the best student. Moving on to get average grade. This is a class method. Now, all this class method is going to do is call this static method, which again, you can think of as a function inside of this class while passing all of the students from this class. Then we have this static method. We get the length of our students. If it's equal to zero, we return negative one because that's what the prompt asked us to do. And if it's not equal to zero, then we sum all the students grades and divide by the number of students. And that will be the average of all of the students or the average grade story of all of the students. So with that said, I will end the video here. I hope you found this helpful. and I look forward to seeing you in another programming expert video. Hello, everybody, and welcome to programming expert. In this video, I'll be going through the solution to the assessment question geometry inheritance. Now, before I get into this, I will mention that at this point, you should have read the prompt. I will briefly go through what it's asking us to do. But if you want all of the details, you can get that from the prompt. So you can see here that we have four classes, 
polygon, triangle, rectangle, and square. Now, what we're being asked to do is implement some methods on these different classes that allow us to get access to the area and the sides of these different classes or of these different objects. Now, we need to treat this polygon class like an abstract base class, and we're going to put two abstract methods on this class, specifically get sides and get area. We're also going to implement the concrete method get perimeter. Then for our triangle, rectangle and square class, since they are all inheriting from polygon, we need to implement these abstract methods. So the get sides and the get area method. Now to help us do this, we have two functions right here, one function to get the area of a triangle and one to get the area of a rectangle. So with that said, let's go ahead and get into the solution. So the first class that I'm going to implement here is the polygon class. Now, this is going to be an abstract base class, so we're not expecting people to actually make an instance of this class. And I need to define the get sides and get area method as abstract methods that are going to raise a not implemented error if you try to use them without implementing them. So I'm going to start by defining the get sides method. So I'm going to say get underscore sides like this. We're going to take in self and we're simply going to raise a not implemented error if you try to call this and you have not actually implemented a concrete implementation. Now that we have the get sides method, let's do get area. So define get underscore area like this. Again, we will take in self and then like before, we'll raise a not implemented error. Now, notice here that I'm not implementing an init method. The reason I'm not doing that is because all of my base classes are going to have a different init. So it doesn't help me to actually have an init inside of this abstract base class because it won't be used by any of these classes. Anyways, now that we have the two abstract methods, I'm going to implement a concrete method. This one is called get underscore perimeter. So the reason why we can put the perimeter on here is because we know that we're going to have a method called get sides. So what we can actually do is we can simply take the sum of all of the sides and that will be the perimeter. And that's going to be the case for all of our different polygons. So we can actually implement the concrete method totally fine. So here I'm going to return the sum of self dot and then this is going to be get underscore sides. Now, this relies on the fact that get sides and get area have been implemented. If these methods have not been implemented or sorry, just the get side method, if the get sides method has not been implemented, then this is going to result in an exception because it's going to raise the not implemented error. Hopefully that makes sense. But again, we can implement this because we know that anything that inherits from here needs to implement these two abstract methods. So once, for example, triangle implements get sides, then this method will work and we'll be able to get the perimeter of the triangle. Same with rectangle and same with square. And it doesn't actually matter how they implement this so long as they return all of the different sides in a list format. OK, so let's continue and then you'll see what I mean. So let's just move on to triangle. This is the next class down. The first thing that I need to do is write the initialization of my triangle. Now to init a triangle, we're going to take in three sides. So I'm going to say init. I'm going to take in self. I'm going to take in side one. I'm going to take in side two. And then I'm going to take in side three. Now I want to store this in a variable called sides or an attribute called sides. So I'm going to say self dot sides equals side one, side two and side three. Now that I have this, I need to implement the two abstract methods, get sides and get area. So I'm going to say define and then this is going to be get sides self like that. And all we're going to do is return self dot sides. Now this is a list of all of the side lengths of this triangle. So now if we call get parameter on triangle, this will work totally fine. Now I'm going to implement get area. So I'm going to say define get area. And I'm going to return like this. And this will be the get underscore triangle area. That's the helper function that we have down here that generates the area of a triangle from three sides. Now, it's not very important that we understand what this formula does. So I'm not going to explain it. Just understand this gives you the area of a triangle with three sides. And we're going to assume here that every single triangle that we're given will be a valid triangle. So all of the side lengths will actually create a triangle because you could be given side lengths that give you a triangle that is impossible to create. But for now, we're going to assume we'll never be given an impossible triangle. Anyways, we're going to go to get area here. And we're just going to call get area and we're going to pass self dot. And then this will be side one, self dot side two and self dot side three. Perfect. That now implements the area for our triangle class. Now let's move on to rectangle. So for rectangle, we need knit. I'm going to say define knit. To initialize a rectangle, we need a width and we need a height. Now what we're going to do is say that the self dot width is equal to width and the self dot height is equal to height. Then we're going to say define get underscore sides and we need to return here something special. We're going to return a list that has the self dot width, the self dot height, the self dot width and the self dot height. 
because when we initialize a rectangle, we just take in two sides, the width and the height. And we know that a rectangle has two sides that are the width length and two sides that are the length of the height. So what we're going to have to do here is duplicate the width two times. So we have self dot width and self dot width and then the height as well, self dot height and self dot height. So this represents the four sides of our rectangle, which then allows us to accurately get the perimeter of it by using the get perimeter method. If we just return the self dot width and self dot height, then we would not be getting the accurate perimeter. OK, so now that we've done that, let's do the same for area. So define get area self. And then we have a function here that returns the area of a rectangle. So all we'll do is say return and then get rectangle area. And we will pass in the self dot width and the self dot height. You can see we just multiply the width and the height together. OK, so now that we've done that, let's implement the square. Now, square inherits from rectangle, which is going to make our life a lot easier. But to get started here, I'm just going to define the init. Now, when we actually initialize a square, all we need is a single side length because, well, all of the sides of a square are going to be the same length. Now, the thing is, when we get the sides of a square or we get the area of a square, that's the exact same as getting it for a rectangle. The only difference is all of our sides are going to be the same. So what I can do here is I can simply say super like this dot underscore underscore init underscore underscore. And I can pass the side length two times to represent the width and the height of this square. So I take in a single side length and then I use it twice to initialize my square with the rectangle init. So now my square is going to have a width and a height attribute, which means I can just use the get sides and get area method that's already defined inside of rectangle. Because when I do self dot width, self dot height, self dot width, self dot height, all of these values are going to be the same because the width and the height are the same for my square. And so I'm going to return four sides that are just the same length, which then allows my get perimeter method up here to work the same as it does for the rectangle. So I'm reusing all of the functionality from the rectangle, just modifying it slightly by making the width and the height be the exact same. That's going to be equal to the side length that I pass in for the rectangle. Now, with that said, that pretty much covers everything that I needed to show you. I'll go through this one more time, but this is the finished solution. So let's go to Polygon. So this is our abstract base class. It's not meant to be instantiated, and it has two abstract methods, get sides and get area. Any class that inherits from this needs to implement these methods to ensure that the concrete method get perimeter is going to work properly. So now we have get perimeter. We just take the sum of the self dot get sides. Now self dot get sides should give us a list of numbers. These numbers represent the side length of our polygon. Then we have class triangle. This inherits from polygon. So we do our initialization. We take in three side lengths and we store that in self dot sides. Then when we override or implement the get sides method from polygon, we just return self dot sides. That's fine. That's exactly what we want. And when we get the area, we just use the get triangle area function, which is a helper function that's already included in your code. OK, fairly straightforward. Now we move on to rectangle. Rectangle inherits from polygon as well, but a rectangle only needs a width and a height. So we take that in. Then for get sides, we need to make sure that we duplicate the width and we duplicate the height so that we have the accurate perimeter when we try to calculate that using the self dot get sides method. Then we have get area. Again, we can use the get rectangle area helper function, which is right down here. OK, fairly straightforward. Now we move on to square. Now a square is simply a rectangle that has the same width and the same height. So it's exactly what we do right here. We pretty much say that by writing this line. We say super dot init super references rectangle. Then we pass the side length twice for the width and the height. And now both of these methods work on the square as well. So with that said, I am going to end the video here. I hope you found this helpful and I look forward to seeing you in another Programming Expert video. Hello everybody and welcome to Programming Expert. In this video, I'll be going over the solution to the assessment question file system implementation. Now in this question, we'll be asked to write a class that represents the simple version of a real world file system. Now you can see that we need to write the methods create directory, create file, read file, delete directory or file, size, and then the private method find bottom note. Now, before I get into the solution here, and I will mention that there's a few different ways that you can solve this, I want to quickly talk about some of the code that's pre-written for us and the structure of this file system. So if you scroll down here, you can see that we have a bunch of code that's given to us to help us solve this. We have a node class, we have a directory class, and we have a file class. We also have a function here that's used within these classes. Now, our file system is going to have a tree-like structure. Now, what that means is we're going to have some type of root node or directory. So in this case, we can see we have our root. This is equal to a directory. And then from there, we can traverse outwards and look for all of the other nodes. So either directories or files that are within this file system. 
So if we look at our directory here, we can see that we have a children structure and this is a dictionary. Now what this means is we're going to store all of the nodes. So again, either files or directories that are inside of this directory in a dictionary. We we'll use the name of the file or directory and then associate it with the actual object. So the file instance or the directory instance. And that's the way we'll access all of these different nodes. So if you hear me talking about node, that just means I'm referring to a directory or a file. We call them nodes because they have similar properties. They all have a name and they're all a part of our file system tree. Hopefully that makes a bit of sense, but you can look at the methods here. We have add node, we have delete node, we have a string method, which is used to help you debug this code. And then for file, we have contents. So every single one of our files will have some type of string contents. We can write the contents like this, and then we can look at the length of the file as well as the string representation of this file. Okay, so that is a brief introduction to what we're being asked to do. Now, what's going to be difficult about this problem is that when we're creating a directory or a file or reading a file or whatever, we're going to be given a path. Now, this path is going to be a string. It might look something like slash home slash Tim slash and then new underscore folder, something like that. So we're going to be given a string. And what we're going to have to do is actually get into the directory. So in this case, it would be the Tim directory and create a new directory inside of there. So we have to go from a string to the actual directory object, which means we need to traverse through our file system starting at the root node to find where this Tim folder is. So hopefully this is making a bit of sense. But if we were to create a new directory, what we would do is pass the path to where we want to make this directory. So in this case, we're saying we want to make a new folder. That's the name of the new directory inside of the slash home slash Tim directory. But the thing is, I don't really know where the slash home slash Tim directory is. At least I don't know where that object is unless I traverse through my file system. So I need to start at my root node from this directory. I need to look for the home folder. Then once I find the home folder from this directory, I need to look for the Tim folder. Then once I have the Tim folder, I can make a new directory inside of here. So I would make a new directory and then I would add it as a child to this Tim directory. So that's kind of the difficulty here. And that's why we're going to write this find bottom node to help us solve these problems. Anyways, now that we've looked at this introduction, let's actually start writing some code. So I'm going to start inside of create directory. And the first thing I want to do is actually parse that path. So we had this path right here. I want to get the name of the new folder we're creating and then the path to where this folder should be placed. So the first thing I'm going to do here is just validate that the path that's given to me is valid. So I'm going to say file system dot validate path and then pass path. This is a static method and it is written right here. If this path does not start with a slash, then it will raise a value error. So I'm going to call this static method. Then what I'm going to do is parse through my path. So I'm going to say that my path underscore node underscore names is equal to and then this is going to be path and one colon dot split. And then we're going to split this at a forward slash. Now, the reason we're doing this is, again, because our path might look something like slash home slash Tim slash folder. So what I want to do is I want to remove this first slash here. Then I want to split this string at every slash, and this will give me a list containing the individual elements. So it'll give me home, it will give me Tim, and it will give me folder. So now that I have that, I can very easily figure out what the name of my folder is versus the path to that folder. So I'm going to say middle underscore node underscore names is equal to, and this is actually just going to be path up to colon negative one. Now this will give us all of the elements except the last element, which means when we want to find our new directory, so let's type directory properly here, underscore name is going to be equal to the path node names at negative one. So we're including everything except the last name because that's going to be the name of our folder. Whereas here we're just getting the last name because that is the name of the folder that we want. OK, so now that we have done that, what we want to do is we want to find the folder that we're going to be placing this new directory inside. of. So again, I'm going to keep going back to this example just to make it really clear. If we have slash home slash Tim slash folder, I need to find this object right here so I can place the folder inside of it. So what we're going to do is we're going to call our private method and we're going to write that now. So I'm going to say before underscore last underscore node is equal to self dot. And then this is going to be underscore find bottom node. And we're going to pass to this the middle node names. So now we're going to go write this method. But what it will do is actually traverse through our file system starting at the root and then give us the object that represents the folder that we want to place this new folder inside. Of. And when I say folder, I really mean directory. I'm going to use those terms interchangeably. 
Okay, so let's go to find bottom node and let's start writing this. So inside of here, I'm going to start by saying my current node is equal to and then this is going to be self dot root. So we're going to start at the root node and then we're going to keep changing this current node to be the next directory that we found. So now I'm going to loop through all of my nodes in my node names. So I'm going to say for node name in node names like that. And the first thing I want to do is just make sure that the current node that I'm on is actually a directory, because if it's not, that's going to cause my program to crash. So I'm going to say if not, and then this is going to be is instance. So we got to spell this correctly. And this is going to be current node and then directory like that. And what I want to do is raise a value error. And I'm just going to put an F string here and say that the current node, not dot class, but dot name isn't a directory like that. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because the next thing I want to check is if the current node name that I'm on is in the current node, because the current node should be a directory. So if it's not a directory, I can't do that. That's why I need to do this first check here. And if it's not a directory, then that means that we were given an invalid path. And so we'll raise a value error because the path we're trying to go to doesn't actually exist. So now I'm going to say if the node name is not in current node dot children, now, the reason this will work is because children is a dictionary and the keys in children are the names of all of the different nodes. So either directories or files. So we're going to check if the current node name that we're on is in the children of the directory that we're looking at. And if it's not, that means again, we were given an invalid path and we're unable to find this node. So I'm going to raise a value error and I'm just going to say like this node not found colon and then we'll put the name of the node. So this is going to be node underscore name. So this means that our current node was a valid directory, but the node name that we're looking for is not inside of this directory. That's what it's telling us. OK, then if all of this is successful, it actually means that the current node name that we're on was inside of the current node directory. So we're going to say that the current node is equal to current node dot children and this is going to be node underscore name because now we're going from the string, which is node name to the actual object that represents this string. OK, so let's do a quick recap here. Actually, first, let me just return the current node. So let's go return current node like that. OK, so what we're doing here is we're setting the current node equal to the root node. Then we are looping through every single name in our list that contains all of the names in our path. So at this point in time, we'll have something like home and then comma and then maybe we'll have Tim like that. OK. So this is the directory that we want to get inside of to make our new directory from here. So what we're doing is we're first looking for the string home as a child of the current node, which is the root node. So we're saying for node name in node names, we start at home. We're going to check, first of all, if the current node that we're on is a directory. If it's not a directory, we need to raise this exception. OK, so if it is a directory, then we check if the current node, so home, is inside of this directory. Now, if home is inside of this directory, it means that home directory exists or that home node exists. So we now set the current node equal to that node because we know it exists. Then we continue. So now what I do is I move on to Tim and I'm checking if Tim is inside of the directory that we just found. But first, I need to check if this is a directory. So we check if home is a directory. If it is, we continue and we check if Tim is inside of home. If Tim is inside of home, then we're good to continue. And what we do is we get access to the Tim folder by saying the new current node is equal to current node dot children at node name, which will be Tim, which will give us that Tim directory. We then return the current node and we have found the node that we are looking for. OK, hopefully that is clear. That is how find bottom node works. Now we're going to continue to use that from inside of create directory. So the only thing that we need to do here after we find the uh, before last node is we need to ensure that this actually is a directory because we wouldn't have done that check inside of the uh, method that we just wrote. So I'm going to say if not is instance and then this is going to be before last node and then we're going to make sure this is a directory. So let's just quickly go back here for one second. You can see that we're setting the current node here. And then as soon as we finish the for loop, we immediately return it, which means the very last node that we find is not guaranteed to be a directory. So since here we need this to be a directory, I need to make sure that the before last node is one before I continue. Now, if it's not, then I'm going to say raise value error and I'm going to say an F string and we will say the before last node dot name. And then this is going to be isn't a directory with a period like that. OK, so now, sorry, the dot name 
my apologies needs to go inside of here. So now that we have this, what we can do is actually create a new directory and put it inside of this directory right here. So we're going to say new underscore directory, and this is going to be equal to an instance of directory. And then this will be new directory underscore name like that, because when we initialize the directory, we just need to give it a name. Now that we've created that, we can add it to our file system by adding it in this directory. So we're going to say before last node dot add underscore node, and we're going to add the new directory. And what this will do is add it as a child of the before last node, which will be the end of the path where we wanted to create this folder. All right, so now that we have done this, I'm just going to copy all of this because now we're going to move on to create file and it's going to be almost identical, except here we're going to create a file rather than a directory. So we're taking in path and contents. But the thing is, just like creating a new directory, we're going to have to find the directory that we want to create this file inside. of. So this part of the code is going to stay the exact same, except rather than new directory name, this is going to be new file name because the last part of our path will now be a file. For example, if we have something like slash home slash user slash and then Tim dot txt like that, then the last part here is now our file name. This is the directory we want to create the file inside of. So again, we need to find this directory object, which is what this will do for us. OK, so let's continue now. So now rather than new directory down here, we're just going to say new file. This is going to take in a file and then rather than the new directory name, this will be the new file name. Now, one change here is we need to actually write the contents to this file. So once we create this file, we're going to say new underscore file and then this will be dot and we need write underscore contents. We're going to pass contents, which will just be a string. Then same here, we're just going to change this to be new underscore file. And now we have implemented this method. So I won't spend too much time on this because it's the exact same as the other one, except now we're just creating a new file. We make the file, write the contents and then add it to the before last node. So we're kind of placing it inside of a directory. It's now part of our file system. OK, now that we have this, what I want to move on to is read file. So I'm going to copy this part of the code here. So just not including the new file aspect and place it inside of here. And what this method needs to do is actually return the contents of the file that we want to read. So all of this will stay the exact same. Again, we need to find the directory that this file will be inside of, except now rather than creating a new file, we actually need to locate this file in the directory and then get the contents of it. So once we get to here, we know that the directory is valid, but we need to check if the file name that we have is inside of this directory. So what I'm going to do is say if and then this will be file name not in and then before last node dot children like that. So we're just checking if the file is inside of the children. If it's not, then that means we had an invalid file name. So I'm going to say F string and then this is going to be file not found. And then we'll put colon and the file underscore name like that with a period. OK, now if we get past this if statement right here, this means that this was a directory and this file was inside of the directory. So we can now read the contents of the file. So we're going to return and then before last node dot children at file name dot contents like that. So we're accessing the file object and then we're getting the contents and just returning. And again, the contents will be a string. Perfect. OK, so now we're moving on to delete directory or file. So again, I'm going to copy all of this because we're going to need to do pretty much the exact same thing, except now we're deleting it. All right. So we just need to change this code slightly. So now rather than new file name, I'm just going to say node to underscore delete and then underscore name like this, because now this is saying delete directory or file. So we can't specify this as a directory or a file because it could be either of them. And to delete them is actually going to be the exact same process. So again, we need to find the last part of the path before the actual name of the node that we want to delete. We need to get that directory. We're going to make sure it's a directory. And then we need to make sure that the folder or the file that we have is inside of this directory. So I'm going to say if node underscore and then this will be to delete underscore name and we'll check if this is not in the before last node dot children, then we need to raise a value error and say node not found and then node to delete name like that. OK, perfect. That's what we need. Let me get rid of the double colon that I have here. So now at this point in time, we know that the node does actually exist. We found it. So all we have to do is delete it. So we're just going to remove it from the folder to delete it. So to do that before last node dot and then delete node and we'll pass to this the node to delete name like that. 
So if you want to see how this works, we can just go to our directory here and notice all we're doing is deleting this from the children, which will remove it from our file system. Perfect. Okay, so we're almost finished. Now what we need to do is write the size method. Now what size needs to do is return the number of characters across all of the files that we have in our entire file system. So we're not just counting the number of directories or files, we're getting the number of characters in only files in our file system. So hopefully that makes sense. But let's start writing this method. We're going to say size equals zero because well, right now we have zero size. We haven't found any files yet. And we're going to say nodes is equal to and then self dot root. So we're going to use this list to actually store all of the files or directories that we need to look through. We're going to pop items off of the list when we've searched through them. So we're going to remove them entirely. And then whenever we encounter a directory, we're going to take all of the contents of that directory. So all of the children and add them into the list. You'll see what I mean, but this is kind of a queue where we're going to be processing all of the different elements inside of here. And as soon as this is empty, we know we will have looked through the entire file system. And so we can stop. So I'm going to say, wow, the len of nodes, and then this is going to be greater than zero like that. I'm going to say the current node is equal to and then nodes dot pop. Now this will remove and return to us the last element from the nodes list. So when we start, we're just starting with the root node. Now we know the root node is going to be a directory, but we don't know that every node we pop off of here will be a directory. So we need to check that. So I'm going to say if is instance, and I'm going to say current underscore node and then directory like this. This means that we need to take all of the children from this directory and actually add them into the nodes list so we can look through them. So I'm going to say children is equal to current node dot children dot values like that. And I'm going to convert this to a list because when you get the values from a dictionary, it gives it to you in kind of a special format. So we just need to convert this to a list. So now that we have a list that contains all of the values of our children, so the actual objects themselves, we want to extend our list. So I'm going to say nodes dot extend children. This will just add all of these items from this list to the end of this list right here. OK, then we're going to say continue because at this point it would have been done with the for loop. All right. So now continuing, I'm going to say if is instance current node. And then this time I'm going to check file. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say size plus equals and then the len of our current node. Now, I don't actually need to look at the contents. I can just call len directly on this current node object because if we go to our file, which is right here, we have an implementation of len. So we're going to use that. We're just going to call len directly on the object. And then that is going to add that length to our size. Then all we actually need to do here is return size. So let's do that. And we are done. Now, let's quickly explain what's going on here. So, of course, we define size equal to zero. We then create our list. Now, before I said to think of this as a queue, you actually want to think of this as a stack. Now, I know we haven't discussed this in programming expert, but if you're familiar with different data structures, this would be like a stack. The whole point is we're going to be adding elements into it and processing them one at a time. So we pop off an element. We then check if this element is a directory or a file. And if it's a directory, then we need to extend this nodes list because there's more stuff that we need to look through. Right. So we start at the root. Then what we're going to do is get all of the stuff inside of it. If inside of it we have directories, then we're going to get all of the things inside of those directories and add them inside of our nodes list. Now, it doesn't really matter the order that we process these elements in, but that's what this is doing here. It's just getting anything inside of the directory and adding them in because we're looking for all of the files. So then we continue and we check if the instance is a file. If the instance is a file and we want to say the size plus equals the len of current node, and then simply return the size because this means we're going to have looked through every single file, gotten the size of all of those files, added them to the variable. So when we return size, we are good to go. Perfect. So with that said, that pretty much wraps up solution number one. There's not much more that I can go through. This is how you implement the file system. Now, I will show you solution number two, which is just a slight variation of this solution. So let's get into that now. So you may have noticed here looking at solution number one that we have a lot of repetitive code. In fact, this right here is used four or five times and there's very little difference when we're using this. So we maybe change a variable name or two, but this should kind of hint to us that we should probably wrap this in a method to make this a little bit cleaner, easier to read and just kind of better practice. Right. It's not a good idea to be repeating code multiple times throughout your program. So what I'm going to do here in solution number two is just kind of clean this up by taking all of this code right here and wrapping it into its own function or sorry, its own method. So I'm going to write a new private method down at the bottom of the class here. So right in between validate path and find bottom node, I'm going to call this define 
underscore. And then this is going to be extract from path. So we just need the word from inside of here. And this is going to take in self and path. Now I'm going to paste all of this code here and we're just going to make some minor changes. So what this is designed to do for us is return to us two things. The first thing that we want is the before last node, and then we want the last node name. So let's do that. Let's change this to be last underscore node underscore name. And then before last node is fine. We just want to make sure that we're not making this specific to directories because it could also be returning a file. So now what I will do here is I'll return two things. So I'll say return. And then this is going to be the before last node as well as the last node name. So now, because I want both of these things in almost all of my functions, I can replace pretty much all of this code here with just a call to the extract from path. So let's just copy this uh, method name. Sorry, I've been saying functions. I mean method. And let's call this here. So what I'll do in here is say before underscore last node and then comma node underscore two underscore delete like that is going to be equal to and then this will be self dot. And we're just going to pass to this the path. So now this will extract the path for us. It will give us the before last node as well as the node to delete. And now we don't need to repeat all of that code. So let's copy this line here and let's now replace that in all of our other methods. So we're going to go here since this is a file specifically. We'll just change this to be file name. So file underscore name like that. The rest of the method will continue to work. Now we're going to go here. We're going to replace all of this. So let's just tab this in properly. And now rather than node to delete again, this is just going to be file underscore name because this is specific to files. Then we are going to go to create directory, replace all of this, paste this in here, and we're going to change this rather than node to delete to be the uh, what is it directory. So we're going to say new underscore directory like that. All right. So that is solution number two. Again, this is identical to solution number one, except now we have this extra method here, which is going to help us avoid having to repeat a ton of code. So with that said, I am going to end the video here. I hope you found this helpful and I look forward to seeing you in another programming expert video.